Welcome to this week's Into the Wilderness podcast. Hopefully we're bringing out on time this time for our regular listeners and subscribers. But I think it was worth the wait because we had the legend who is Ed Stafford on our show last well, time. We've had some great feedback from the show and we were kind of expecting that to be honest because he's a great guest to have on and we just wish we had more time with him. But he's he's a very busy ha- man. We'll so have we to just have him on again. As simple as that. Well, he, he is welcome. If he happens to listen to this one, he is welcome back on any time. And Byron just gave me some news, literally two minutes ago, about his book. Yeah, I got an email from um, Ed's publicist uh, just a couple of days ago uh, who had listened to the podcast and was very happy with it. And as a result, they're sending us up another copy of Ed's book to give away on this podcast. So if you are interested in getting your hands on his book, Adventures for a Lifetime, you'll need to tune in to the next podcast in two weeks' time because we will uh, give you the info for how to win that on that show. It, it we'll give it away and we'll probably run it probably just before Christmas. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. so we, we make so, a great so, Christmas so, gift. so someone can have it for either keep it for themselves or give it to someone for uh, a Christmas gift. Uh, but you know, flicking through the book, it's it is a great book. There's some great great um, adventures and uh, lots of them very achievable for the, the normal person. And if they're not achievable, they will give you an idea of what the inspiration, the inspiration of what you possibly could do. And you know, find things on your doorstep. There are some things in there from the diving world as well, which I've known about for a wee while, and I've always wanted to do. And I think very achievable. So I just need to get myself over to Belize because some of these places look absolutely amazing. The thing behind the book is just to give you give you the inspiration to just go and do something different. Yeah. Oh, there's actually one here which I didn't see before, which is the Colorado. Um, the Grand, the Grand Canyon, Canyon, which the white water rafting. Philip Bloom did the recording of the, that exact white water rafting thing. Yeah, which is very cool. I think. Well, we might be in find ourselves in Colorado next year. That'd be really cool if we did. Yeah. Maybe, we, maybe we can tick tick ourselves. The Coolin Ridge, I think we did talk about on last week, is actually in the book. So I'm not sure that I could do that winter. I don't no, think I've got the skills uh, to do I th- that. I think it's very challenging in winter. Yeah. We we were just there, well, near the Coolins last week when we were in the other sky, but. It's an epic mountain range if you've never seen it before. Um, I mean, it is razor sharp in some some um, parts. If most people have probably seen the Coolin Ridge because Danny McCaskill did a, a really good film. I actually can't remember the name of it, but it was a Red Bull film. And if you just type in Danny McCaskill, I think it's called The Ridge, actually. It could very well be. Yeah, just type that in on YouTube. So I'm saying that I'm not sure that I could do The, the Ridge in winter, and he did it in his, on his bike. <laughs> <laughs> but he's yeah, got he, a different, uh, different skill set, that man. Yeah, he does. Now, what we got? What we well, got? we've got uh, an awesome podcast for you today. We have s- spent the last um, two or three years with the gent who is our guest, uh, doing various projects all around Scotland. He's a fishing guide. His name is Corin Smith. If you don't know him as a fishing guide, you might very well know him as uh, some might say um, a salmon farming activist. Maybe I don't think he particularly likes that title, but he is. He is. It, moving in those circles. He's been doing a lot of work uh, to sort of uncover the real story behind salmon farming and its impacts, particularly in Scotland. And that is the bulk of what this podcast is about. Uh, We do start off talking about his early life, which is actually really fascinating as a fishing guide and and how he he got into it and what his sort of day-to-day business is. Uh, But then we really, really get to grips with what salmon farming is and what we all need to consider if we're buying farm salmon, I would shops. I would stress this: it's not a podcast about banning salmon farming. That's no. not what it's about at all. It's it's about I think the best way to describe it because it is quite long. So you need to know what you're a way to go into is it's about transparency, I guess, more than anything, finding the actual truth and trying to solve the problems that are, that are there. I think that's the best way to describe the podcast. I hope that anybody who who listens to this podcast feels that we have tackled it through the questions that we're we're asking Corin and the way that he's come back with his answers that we are genuinely just trying to understand and yeah. uncover exactly what we need 
to get to grips with. I, and I think I think it would only be fair if uh, we, I don't know, maybe actually send this podcast to some of the the fish farming groups and ask for a response. And if one, if, if they want to come on the show or, or send a representative to speak and cover the things that have been talked about, then why not? Yeah, no, I, I think it's only fair if we do that. That. It, and that is that is true of any time that we are tackling a particular topic. It, it's quite difficult to tackle it from both sides evenly all the time. Although we we try our best to ask the sort of the probing questions, no matter what side we might sit on ourselves. Uh, but, but yeah, that that's it's true. Any, anybody is welcome on here if they would like a comeback on anything that's been said. We we, we invite Chris Packham on all the time, but he's yet to pick up our offer. Yeah, and and sometimes we've offered people that are quite mouthy online to come on the show, and uh, they never take up the offer either because uh, it's easy to hide behind a screen, but not easy to come and face the music or the talking uh, the talk. <laughs> yeah. I, genuinely when we finished this podcast i was absolutely buzzing i couldn't believe that the amount of time had passed that it had uh i just i, f- I kind of felt invigorated with information yeah and i hope you do too uh there are a couple of things which have happened in the last couple of weeks which we're not going to talk about in great depth now because it's already a long podcast uh but know that they haven't slipped us by and we will be covering them uh most of you will have seen um the hunter Larissa in the newspapers, especially in the UK, the, the US hunter, and what has been coined goat gate, uh, the hunting of a couple of different species and being largely misrepresented in the media as to exactly what goes on there. I'll say no more on it than that for now, uh, but we will be tackling it, but tackling it properly in long form discussion uh, as level headed and pragmatic as possible trying to get rid of all the the rubbish that you see in social media to really understand what goes on there. And uh, we actually had a phone call from um, the very people involved to some extent. Um, So watch the space. You're going to really hear what goes on there uh, when we put that podcast together. We highlighted on social media some weeks ago, off the back of listening to a Farming Today program from the BBC, about a potential issue with our brown hair population. And then basically having mass die-offs. The um, the doctor behind that, I can't remember the university off the top of my head, but if you go and have a look on our Facebook, we put up a big post about it. It's been picked up by everybody now since we since we posted up about it, including a lot of newspapers. But Dr. Bell was her name. Uh, essentially, for now, just keep your eye out. If you see a dead brown hair, especially if it's fresh, wear gloves, bag it, and go and Google it online, and, and you'll find it. out where to where. No, they prefer it not to be frozen. Really? Potentially, if mm. it's fresh, and they, no, you if can they get can it pick quickly, it up quickly, yeah. then they prefer it not to be frozen. Um, but just go and Google it online hair populations uh, in the UK mass die-offs, and you'll find all of the information and in all the centres that you can take them to. And we're going to be covering it in more detail. The GWCT have um, uh, given advice on the shooting of woodcock this year. This is a subject that we covered with um, a number of people yeah, we've covered it a few last times. year yeah. uh, in particular, where there was, again, recommendation about not shooting woodcock. This year, they're just saying, please refrain until the 1st of December uh, because it looks like, although they're not 100% sure exactly how the populations are faring just yet, but it looks like they've had quite a hard time because of the very dry summer over in the the countries that they, they spend their, their summer time in. And... Very last thing before we get into the podcast, and we tell you, well, actually we've got to talk about the competition, but with Packham is back on the cards. Chris Packham has reinvigorated his campaign to change Scottish moorlands, even though he doesn't even live here. Um, so we will be tackling that again with a few people who can hopefully shed a bit of light on what he's trying to achieve and he's, probably counter it. Yeah, he's he's um, brought in uh, people Some to big support hitters. him. Uh, Friends of the one, Earth, One, one kind, kind, League Against Cruel Sports, and the Common Wheel. Yes, who is a land reform um, organization, organization kind, of, yeah. kind of in Scotland. So he's trying to hit it from the land reform side of things, which is actually quite a smart move. Yep, a lot of big hitters. So uh, we'll see how that sort of pans out, but we'll be bringing you more on it. And this is the last thing, which is the competition. Now, we are actually recording this intro about a week before the podcast goes out. So the competition, which ran from two weeks ago, which was to win a CZ Firearms doormat, will be announced on social media. So go and have a look there. But your chance to win something on this show 
we have up for grabs the latest edition of the Hornady Reloading Manual. So if you're into reloading, you no need the latest edition, absolutely, because it's got some of the, the new cartridges in there. It's got all the new loads from some the updated powders. It's got all the Creedmoor cartridges in there, um, so the, the, the latest designs in, in terms of bullet construction um, from Hornady. So it is a must it's worth for your reloading bench. Quid, but <laughs> it is worth quite a bit. Uh, so that is what we have up for grabs. And if you're not into reloading, you should think about it because that's just quite addictive. If you like, it's like fly tying for shooting. <laughs> yeah, that's how I always look. Especially, at it. I, I think, especially if you are, I think maybe from even more the target people because it can become addictive, like refining the the. I find it very addictive ba- in a bad way because it makes me try and push my ammo beyond what I can probably shoot. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, it's it's it is a great way to fill your winter months, and it also means that your ammunition bill... It saved money. Yep, goes down, so you can spend more time on the range shooting ammo for the same amount. Well, enjoy this... Oh, we need to tell people how to enter it. Oh, sorry, sorry, I was running... We, we've just, we've, we've, we've <laughs> just put the carrot out yeah, yeah. there for the... You can have a book, but I'm not <laughs> you can have a book. enter it. Um, I'm just trying to think. This is a, we make this mistake on a regular basis, not working out how people can enter before we... Uh, I actually mentioned that there's something to win on the podcast. Maybe people just need to put their ring in. Oh, no. We did decide. Actually, we did discuss it. We would like you to subscribe to the website. Oh, yeah, we did, yeah. Thepacebrothers.com. If you've already subscribed, you don't need to resubscribe. You are already entered. Yeah. Pacebrothers.com. Go to the bottom of the page. Subscription. Chuck your email in there, and you'll be added, essentially, into a randomly picked raffle for this, which we will announce on the next podcast. And do not fear. Subscribing to our website does not mean that you will receive junk mail, because I don't think we've even sent anything out this year. I don't think we have, which is actually bad, uh, but we don't spam you. No. Uh, only things of interest. Genuinely, I don't think we've sent a single mail, have, uh, mail to anyone on the from the subscribers list, uh, but you will get one at the end of the year, because we'll do like an end of year roundup kind of thing. Um, but Yep, subscribe. And that is it. So we do hope that you enjoy the show and please give us some feedback. Uh, We are planning on doing more shows like this, especially on aquaculture and fishing related stuff. So let us know if you enjoyed it. And don't forget to leave us a review if you do enjoy it. And even if you don't enjoy it, still leave a five star review. (laughs) Corin, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Thank you very much. Great cup of tea. <laughs> well, that's a good start if the tea's good. Uh, we met you, I was just trying to think actually when we were prepping for the podcast. Was it two years ago or three years ago when we were doing the Loch Marie project? Three years ago now? Uh, yeah, probably three years ago, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, via uh, the guys that commissioned you. Yeah, um, for I, salmon trout conservation. Yeah, yeah. I can't actually remember why they put us in touch. But Well, I think the first time we met in person was uh, in in Parliament. In the Scottish Parliament. Oh, when the that's film was right. Shown. Yeah, 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 yeah. When we did the presentation. That we had spoken on the phone yeah. before. Yeah, 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 that, yeah okay. is the, that is the first time, actually. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, salmon. We're going to talk about salmon farming, probably a bit about fishing. But before we get to that, because there's a perfect link in with Loch Marie as, as the sort of starting point of probably what is going to be the, the bulk of our conversation today. But one thing I've personally always wanted to speak to you about in a bit more depth because you know we've done unrelated bits of work with you now for the last sort of two or three years which has been great we've been traveling all around scotland and doing some fishing and filming is your early guiding career outside this country because the little snippets that you've told me about that it's been fascinating you know there's a lot of people who think of fishing gillies in particular in scotland as They've sort of put it in this box as this is what it is, but you as a you are a fishing ghillie, but you're more of a guide, and that is something that not a lot of people here in Scotland really think about. They think about the traditional ghillies on the river, but there is this big world out there for fishing guides. How, how did that come by? You're obviously passionate about fishing when you were a youngster, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I was born and brought up on a, a, a sheep farm um, up in the hills uh, at Blair Athels and there was, you know, there's rivers and streams and things so it, there I spent most of my spare time running around digging up worms and trying to catch trout in the in the rivers and things. Um, so I was always into, I've always been into into fly fishing um, 
uh, dad, I think, first of all, got me started fly fishing when I was about five or something. Um, Your dad's a mad keen fisherman, isn't he? He is dead keen, yeah, yeah, very keen. And annoyingly, <laughs> despite his incredibly um, low technical ability, <laughs> um, still, um, and that's maybe a bit unfair because he, he's, 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 he's brushed seems up seems to his, be consistent. He's brushed up his casting standards. But yeah, annoyingly, he's um, he still probably outfishes me whenever we go out. Um, but no, he... he um, I mean, Dad's granddad was a big um, fly fisherman, um, and, and incidentally used to fish on Loch Marie a fair bit as well, which sort of um, brings it all kind of this big circle back round again. But um, yeah, Dad, Dad was a shepherd on an estate um, over near Kinloch Rannoch, um, which had a spectacular brown trout loch in Alistair, um, and so Dad used to drag me out when I was about f- I don't know five or six years old and row me around the loch. Um, and generally, I'd freeze my arse off in a. But that sits with you because I know what it's like for us when you're that age and your parents are bringing you along to what is their passion. You can never really escape it for the rest of your life. Well, that was certainly my experience with hunting and fishing. Yeah, yeah, I know. But the funniest thing is, at the time, it seems like a absolute misery. You know, you're <laughs> freezing cold. All I remember is like is is um, is wearing these like really cheap, nasty wax jackets you used to get from um, Davidson's. The, like uh, the local farmer's store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a, like, a, a, and you'd sit in that thing absolutely freezing with water trickling down the back of your neck, generally like pretty bored. But it is, it, you'd come back off the water and then you'd sit in the boatman's house. Got, you know, you had no concept of time, but, you know, dad and the boatman would be sitting there drinking whiskey and there'd be steam on the windows and <laughs> smoking like chimneys. Um, and but that's the like that's your that's some of my fondest memories. It is you know, looking back there. at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. Um, but yeah, no. So I, I, you know, I was always a, a, a pretty keen fisherman all the way through being a kid. Um, you know, I, I loved um, tanking around the hills, um, trying to catch trout and pike and all that kind of stuff. Never really did any significant salmon fishing or anything like that. Um, and then um, when I was, a, I suppose when I was in teens into 20s, I drifted away from it a little bit, but I still fished pretty regularly. Um, but uh, late 20s, um, I was getting moved around a lot with work and I was um, uh, down in Australia. So I started fishing, doing some saltwater fishing. Fly, uh, saltwater fly fishing? Saltwater fly fishing, yeah. Just on the beach and things like that. Initially catching sea trout in the saltwater and then... I didn't know, know they had sea trout though. Yeah, 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 they do. They've got, well, they have brown trout and a, a little run of sea trout as well huh. um, on the East Coast and quite a big run of brown trout um, on the West Coast. Uh, well, I say Australia, I mean Tasmania. Ah, okay. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so I ended up, you know, kind of getting into the saltwater fishing and from sea trout progressed to to the, the other species, uh, the, like colder saltwater species like uh, tuna and things like that. And then, you, you know, you read and you read and you read. Um, and then I found out about tropical saltwater fishing and bonefish and all that kind of stuff. And as a just as a as a kind of tourist traveling angler, went on a couple of trips and loved that. Um, and then I finished up with work uh, when I was you know I was office based working down in Australia, um, and I'd been working at that for a long well I say a long time, but um, I'd gone straight from school, dropped out of university within a couple of months. So I'd gone st- almost straight from school into work, and I'd never taken any time out. Um, so I decided to take a couple, uh, well, take a year out um, and fish my way around the globe and fish all the places I'd been thinking about. Um, and that was, it was amazing, but I pretty quickly kind of arrived at the conclusion that um, I didn't just want to be sort of standing in front of a guide being told what to cast at. It was almost like sort of glorified target practice a lot of the time. I wanted to understand, you know, why the fish were where they were when they were, you know, so you want to... You want to understand about the species, what they feed on, tides, weather, all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to get deeper into it, so that's when I decided, right, I, I want to be a fly fishing guide. Um, and weirdly, considering that I started fly fishing in Scotland, um, my first job as a fly fishing guide was on the Val River in South Africa. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that was a baptism of fire for a whole <laughs> load of different reasons. Um, not necessarily related to fishing, but I did six weeks on the Val with... Um, uh, the guys at Fly Castaway, um, and um, I was mentored by um, Arno Mattia, uh, who's uh, just a, a for me anyway a, a legend in in fly fishing, um, uh, as well as the other guides. 
especially uh, you know the young guides that were there as well at the same time. Yaku, Timo, Ryan, um, you know, we all were um, kind of dead keen on fishing, but learning to guide, which is very different from just, you know, fishing. So we did five or six weeks on the Val, and then we all were packed off by um, Gerard and Keith, the uh, the other two kind of directors of, uh, of Fly Castaway, and we're all packed off up to the Seychelles, and that's um, where we... It's not a terrible thing, that, is it? It's not... Ho- there, are yeah, worse, yeah. there are worse locations to go. It, it, so, it, it sounds like... Uh, it sounds idyllic, and it, it's an incredible experience, but, um, you know, we were working... Uh, on the outer islands um, so logistically it was pretty complex to get us there and guests you know you're talking about um, a charter flight for you know two and a half up to two and a half hours um, south off the main island over water land on a small deserted strip get all the guys off and we'd be we'd meet a um, a mothership there and then running guys you know you're basically surf launching on and off the beaches to get all the gear and guys then the mothership would sail, you know, another 40-odd miles from there to this remote island or atoll with no one on it. Um, so it was, it, it, you know, it was an um, it was an unbelievable experience working down there um, uh, and a real, a real adve- like a proper adventure. Um, and that was really kind of, well, I mean, it, it was a real baptism of fire in terms of just learning what... Uh, what a, you know that being a fly fishing you guide must have to learn quick out there with new species and new environment you do yeah yeah um you do have to learn real quick and it's it's com- it's really complicated because you're um you know you're you're in you're fishing in three dimensions you know, you've got um the fish um you you got to account for for their kind of movements um uh, according to weather but also particularly according to tide as well um, and you've got all these different variables to figure out. Um, and then, of course, the other massive variable is the anglers that you've got standing next to you, some who are incredibly experienced, some who it's their first trip, first fishing trip. Um, so um, that whole process of, you know, one, you know, getting everyone to the location, then getting everyone onto the flat, then finding a fish, and then finding a fish that an angler can cast at, getting them to cast at it, getting them to catch it, release it, get your photos, you know, spend the rest of the day, get back to the boat, keep them happy, deal with the gear, um, try and sort of function and stay alive when there's tropical storms and things. Um, it was all, it, it, is, it, it was real interesting. Just out of interest, what did you go and study for a few months at university? Um, I was going to ask them that. <laughs> I was signed up for biological environmental science and French. Um, and well, I don't French. know about the French part, but the rest of it makes sense to where you've ended up. <laughs> well, uh, m- maybe, yeah. I, I I don't really know. Well, I do know actually. I I think I was probably signed up for an actuarial course. I was more of a mathematician. Um, I think I was signed up for an actuarial course at Aberdeen, if I remember, because most of my pals from school were were heading there. And then I met a girl over uh, the summer holidays who had fatal. Decided, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who I decided that I'd fallen in love with, and that she was going to Edinburgh University. <laughs> And so I think so I, you were yeah yeah so then I think I applied for a place through clearing and the only place you know the only thing that I could get with my grades was bio, this joint honors thing biological science and French for uh, for everyone uh, for everyone listening that, that is not a great way to decide what university you're going to or what course to decide <laughs> yeah I wouldn't recommend it it was great it was a great laugh for for three months and then I thought it's just dull as it's just dull as dishwater and the thing that really got me was that. When I'd finished school, I thought that was the end of of studying and having to work hard. And then <laughs> you realised it was the start. <laughs> when I got to uni, yeah, and you've got these course tutors, like you had to do even more. And I was like, this cannot, you know, these guys can't be serious. You know, I've been at this for ages. So. And plus, I had to pay, you know, a hundred quid for a biology encyclopedia. And I was like, right, that's it. I'm 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 going to go and <laughs> earn some fishing. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. Oh, interesting. Yep. But, yeah. I, well, I, I don't know if you're... So I'm assuming the romance didn't last if you packed off after three months. You know what? I'm not <laughs> sure that the romance ever started. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the, that was the sad thing about it all. <laughs> oh, dearie me, sir. But it's, um, it's a process for deciding my future, which I've, which I've stuck to throughout my life. And it's, um, you know, it's paid dividends. Yeah, well, you might not be where you are now. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, ended exactly, up in Aberdeen. yeah. <laughs> So, from Seychelles, oh, hang on, there's something about that I wanted to ask you about because you, this is something we discussed around the dinner table and it was absolutely disgusting. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about that again, so everybody else could hear. You were talking about the end of the end of the season, the the process that you had to do go through to get your feet back in order in the Seychelles with the salt. 
you're going I mean, to a foot doctor. Oh, yeah, to removing the skin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, it, when you're... The season would, would last from... Um, well, now it's even longer, but we were down there usually from late November. Um, I mean, we'd, we'd be... Th- uh, in essentially, literally in the water from late November up until Christmas, then we'd take off uh, about four or five weeks off and then be back from um, mid to late January all the way through to uh, sort of middle of April or something. And when you're guiding, you know, the 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 um, the, the routine uh, is pretty straightforward. You know, the, it's a seven-day week. Clients will be fishing six of those seven days and the seventh day is a is a turnaround day when you're running back and forth from the the, the, the airstrip basically to pick up clients and on those six days um from eight o'clock in the morning until sometimes as late as six um you're walking around wet wading around the flats in salt water so your feet are in salt water all the time um and obviously you've got wading boots and things like that on but um you know your feet are wet all the time and i don't know what the process is but for me what used to happen was i just got this massive sort of build up or what would appear to be a, like a build up of skin on your feet now whether it was the skin dying away or i'm not sure but you got to the end of the season and apart from having the most ridiculous suntan in the world <laughs> where you had a suntan from sort of just above your knees down to your ankles um and then you were pure white from the ankles down which meant that you looked i mean unbelievably hot when you're walking around in a pair of shorts <laughs> at the uh, at the town disco and you had these like hazelnut brown legs from um from uh, just above your knees down to your ankles and then you were pure white from just below from just above the ankles down to your feet when you're in flip-flops it was a great look um <laughs> it, but, it looks like socks from a distance right? yeah well it did yeah yeah, yeah exactly look white socks but um, yeah, no. The, on, on my feet, on the soles of my feet, and just kind of up around the edges. After the season had finished, your feet would dry out, and essentially, what you were left with was this kind of skin, about five, you know, literally about five mils of like rock hard, dead skin on your feet, and it would come off like. I mean, if you started peeling it, it would come off like sort of strips of wallpaper. This is horrendous. But bearing in mind for everyone listening, he told us a story at the dinner table the first time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, I used to go to um, whatever you call them, a, a chiropodist or something, um, and um, he would get out this thing that looked almost like a cheese grater <laughs> oh, and just no. um, just grate away the dead skin <laughs> from around your feet, and you'd be left with this sort of pile of, of parmesan shavings at the oh, end. Jesus. I hope no one's eating. Right <laughs> Hillbilly chewing gum, <laughs> but it fixed your feet up, and they were fine after that. Yeah, yeah, no, your feet, your your feet were fine. Um, I mean, you had, you always had at the end of the season. You had, I mean, when you're in salt water that amount of time every day, any kind of cuts or anything, they don't heal at all when they're in salt water, and especially in a tropical environment. So they just get bigger and bigger. Um, so um, you know, the end of the season was always a chance to kind of dry out and let everything heal. But um, yeah, no, no lasting injuries. Polly, one of the other. One of the other guys I used to work with, he <laughs> came back at the end of one season with coral growing out of his shin. That's crazy. Um, yeah, so we used to get things like that, but but nothing too. Do you severe. keep it as a memento? Or? Knowing Polly more <laughs> more than likely. Uh, and from the Seychelles to Scotland, now instead of having issues with your feet like now that now you just stink in waders. Yeah, yeah, we'll live in waders. Yeah, it, it's um, yeah. I remember when we were working in in the Val in South Africa that my my waders were banned. Um, from the guidehouse because they reeked so badly, and that 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 still that still goes on today. I'm not sure what it is. No no amount of foot powder seems to make a difference. I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is, but um, yeah. Well, at least there's no bugs live inside them. That's the main thing. How did so? What was the the process from Seychelles back to here? So from from then to when we sort of met you and you're you're guiding around Scotland. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, Were you carrying on doing, guiding after that period? Well, the Seychelles, the whole Seychelles thing finished in 2009 because Somali pirates started hijacking or trying to hijack, um, the, uh, well, did hijack one of the, um, the vessels, the motherships we used, um, in the outer islands. Wow. Um, thankfully without any guides or guests on it, I think, um, I was working in Angola at the time, um, on another job, um, but the the team in Seychelles they just got off the the boat Indian Ocean Explorer with um, you know probably ten guests and and, and four guides they just got off the boat and um, um, jumped onto the the King Air and, and flown back to Seychelles 
and as the boat left the the mooring, uh, it was taken by um, with the some, with the uh, Seychelles Wa crew on board. It was taken by Somalian pirates, um, the same guys that had been hijacking oil tankers and things. You remember back then they were they were starting oh, was, on oil tankers and then they it was started, like every week. Yeah, well yeah. then they started the hostage industry. Um, it's so, a bit more lucrative, getting people to pay you for people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's easier to uh, store half a dozen hostages than it is to than an oil tanker. Yeah, yeah but they, even with the oil tankers, they, they were basically ransoming it back. Yeah, they, yeah. They weren't using it for anything. They, no, but, no. But the smaller boats they were, they were using the small boats. Sometimes they would keep those for longer range for right. more, more pirating. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the vessel that they took, um, the one that we'd been using, Indian Ocean Explorer, was a 120, 140 foot. Um, dive boat basically and they took that all the way back up um, to the Somali coast um, with the I think it was eight or nine crew on board um, and uh, yeah the crew who we all knew really well we'd been you know we'd work with them every day for the last two or three years or the two or three seasons they were taken up there and held for 88 days before um, 88 days yeah before the Seychelles Wa government um, negotiated their release so, so that could have been anybody who was on there that could have been there it could I mean the 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 speculation afterwards was that they'd had a tip off that there was a, it, there was um, uh, a group of um, eight uh, Americans on the boat that yeah. were that were fishing with our with yeah. our company worth a bit more money yeah yeah and they they just missed them literally by about wow. an hour an hour and a half that's crazy um, and there's a, a really good book Francis Ruku the captain Francis um, amazing amazing guy for a whole number of different reasons but he wrote a book eighty eight days um, about um, his boat being taken, him and the experience of being held by the Somali pirates, which is a which is a fantastic read. Might have to check that out. I, I would do, yeah. And it's you know I know from you know knowing Francis firsthand, he's a very, a real genuine, straightforward, stand up guy, um, and everything in the book is is uh, is, um, is is real honest and and as it was. But yeah, so the 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 IOE being taken by the pirates pretty much. You know, shut down Seychelles in two thousand and nine for, um, well, actually shut it down for about five years. The, the next boat back in was, um, with uh, was to do any kind of exploratory fishing stuff on the outer islands. Was actually myself and Arno Matia. Um, Arno um, chartered a boat and managed to <laughs> I don't know how managed to convince some clients to go and check out the islands again that it was safe. And we ended up going back in two thousand and fourteen to um, an island called Providence. Um, but after 2009, um, I uh, kind of bailed out of the Indian Ocean guiding stuff. Um, my only options were to go and work uh, for Fly Castaway at uh, an amazing bone fishery um, at St. Brandon's down in Mauritius. Um, but I didn't really want to guide just bonefish all day, every day. A bit boring eventually. Yeah, it's a bit straightforward. And it, it's, I mean, it, it's an amazing fishery mm-hmm. to go and visit for a, a week or 10 days. Yeah, as a client. Yeah, yeah, yeah. incredible. But as a guide, um, you know, the places we, we were working on these um, kind of multi species atolls um, where we were, you know, we're guiding for bonefish, um, giant trevally, um, and permit on the flats, and then also other stuff like milkfish, triggerfish. Um, on flats and then we also had the blue water fishery as well so it was really you know really mixed and a real challenge and um, I, I didn't fancy just just doing a bone fishery so I can't actually remember what happened after that I was I was spent um, 2009 and 10 I, I, my base had been in Johannesburg and I ended up coming back to Scotland and, and basing myself in Scotland again and um, but I was still traveling away a lot fishing just on my own behalf because when you when you guide you, you don't fish at all no um you know i never fished a I never fished a day as a guide in the seychelles um uh so i was away doing a bit of fishing on my own behalf in australia and america and places like that fishing a lot for for tarpon in the keys and on the gulf coast um and then in about 2012 i think again i made a rather hasty decision based on f- thinking that I'd fallen in love with a girl. <laughs> that, I'm seeing a common theme here, Gordon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that uh, I'd based myself in Scotland um, and... Because uh, ultimately... Went, went to university. <laughs> 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 yeah. This time Glasgow. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely going to work this time. Um, no, d- decided to come back um, and, um, I, you know, I'd been travelling with work because, I, I, you know, with the guiding and the work I was doing before, you know, I'd, I'd had been on the road from sounds like years 2000 and from the year 2000 to the year 2009 um you know i'd been away from home 
Um, and for the last, you know, from 2000 and from the end of 2006 through to the end of 2009, I wasn't in the same place for more than, uh, I think, more than about three months. So pretty nomadic. Yeah. Um, and, and Tinder didn't exist back then. No, no, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't need to. Love, love, will lead, love will lead you wherever you need to go. Don't worry about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I decided that I, I didn't want to travel so much and, um, you know, home is home. Mm. So I got a dog, got a girlfriend, and decided that I was going to... Um, run a fly fishing fly guiding business in the uh, in scotland um and that's uh that was back in about 2012 and that's and that uh, exists as wild rise that we know it today that's what became wild rise yeah um and uh i still have the dog wild rise is obviously doing pretty well and the, the girlfriend went south pretty quickly as well that that, that that sadly didn't last very long the dog's important though the dog is really important what i think and he's more, quite a character well i think most people come fishing to meet monty rather than <laughs> anything else um but yeah yeah no he's a character he's still still going strong good fishing dog he'll lie he's down. the only dog i've i've ever met that will eat a fish from its head first now he, he will eat it, but I've never seen one stay down. It nearly always comes back up again about half an hour later. Right. So um, no, I missed that part. So yeah. what is your what does your fishing around Scotland consist of? Uh, well, I mean, because like like we alluded to at the beginning, you're not like a traditional fishing ghillie, ghillie here, as such. No, well, I mean, in Scotland, the it's only in recent in the recent years that a you know a guide industry in terms of the you know the way you'd 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 encounter it in the US for example in the word, in the way that you'd encounter a, a a fly fishing guide at sort of destination lodges that that as an industry has only really just started to emerge in Scotland um and um you know there is a there is a real although there's a, there's a lot of grey areas now because you have gillies sort of working as gillies but also doing a bit of guiding and things like that usually in that direction not often the other way but there is a you know there is a, a distinct difference between a, a ghillie and a fly fishing guide, um, and uh, the way I usually kind of describe it, um, not that it really anyone is really that bothered about the distinction, but um, a guide is like uh, if you use golf as a metaphor, a guy a fly fishing guide is like your caddy. You know he's with the the client. He manages the client relationship. He's with the the client. He knows what the client's good at, what they're bad at, what they're wanting to do, all that kind of stuff. So he's really managing the client. Um, uh, the the ghillie is more uh, to keep going with the golf metaphor. The ghillie's really more like the um the greenkeeper and the the kind of course manager. So they'll know the golf course absolutely back to front you know they know every in in the case of the, the gilly on the river you know the every rock every kind of little bit of current where the fish sit and all that kind of things to a degree way beyond the yeah, fly they're, they're an expert in that beat yeah wherever yeah. is there yeah a gilly. Uh, uh, yeah absolutely and um so they you know they'll generally know way more than the the, the than, a, than a fly fishing guide will do about that particular stretch of water but what they don't know is the is the is the client uh, or generally don't know the client. Although obviously traditionally in Scotland there was, you know, um, the Gillies had a very kind of strong relationship with with families that were coming back and fishing year after year after business, year. Yeah. But that you know that's changed a lot. I'm I'm really talking about the you know the the sort of what you get more of nowadays, which is um, the sort of day ticket fishers and things like yeah. that. So in simple terms, that's the difference between the two. Really, is that you know the, the Gillies Gillies look after their 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 stretch of water and they do have some um you know they do have a, a a reasonable role in looking after clients and things like that whereas a guide will look after no water and their entire time is spent you know dealing with the client um so that that i mean that's that is that's what you do yeah you're yes. looking after clients you're trying to put them in places that they in terms of fishing that they're interested in yeah so the the guide my business my guide business is a is a kind of amalgamation of probably a few different things and and there's a you know there's probably let me see there's probably there's probably only really three or four maybe as much as half a dozen sort of guys who are making a full time living out of guiding in scotland um and we all do it slightly differently um but for you know my kind of model is um a, probably a combination between the traditional kind of agency based model where you're where I'm going to find in locations and doing a little bit of marketing of the location um as well as um uh you know just um being approached by travel and fly fishermen who say that you know they want 
you to take them fishing somewhere. Um, so yeah, that that's that that that's generally how it works. But well, you you also do photography as well. Oh yeah, we forgot. I f- forgot yeah, about that. Whole, that's what we've been side, talking about. Well, you don't just fishing, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I've always done a few different things, but the um, the photography cascaded out of the fishing because you know way back when I started working as a fly fishing guide. Say way back, it was only. Um, 2006. You're not that much of an old man yet. No, no. You've got a lot of grey in your beard coming through though. <laughs> oh, Jesus. It's, it's not the years, it's the miles. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, back in 2006, you know, we, we you think how quickly technology has moved and back then, you know, we had some little waterproof point and shoots but in terms of selling fly fishing holidays, you know, to the Seychelles, that was one of the only ways we were getting media out was, um, was just taking pictures on the flats and things like that. Mm. But you, you know, you, the one of the the directors of the business, um, Gerard uh, Loebscher, he's always been a really good and keen photographer. So he kind of set fairly high standards in terms of um, what we were expected to shoot on the flats. But even with these little point and shoots, so we learned kind of principles of composition and depth of field and all that kind of stuff, which at the time we probably didn't real, we weren't particularly interested in photography and thinking about it. But um, over the years, you know, the, there was just a sort of arms race for good photography so you got better and better and better and more and more gear and then when I came back here you know running your own guide business here all the guides will tell you a massive part of running the business is just around generating content and media and it's got to be of a reasonably high standard nowadays an incredibly high standard mm. just, everyone just to compete just to everyone. compete yeah, I, it, yeah you know fly fishing working in fly fishing um, industry as a professional whether you're selling trips or gear or whatever it is you're doing um, you know we always used to have a a, a, a motto at Fly Castaway, and that is as simple as content is king. You know, whoever has the best content wins pretty much. Um, so um, <clears throat> the photography uh, I do now just basically cascaded out of that, and I need you know, especially in the off season. You know, in Scotland, there's a a, a relatively long off season, although you can fish for different species throughout the year. That the commercial kind of season um for me anyway ends sort of round about at the middle of october beginning of november and doesn't really kick off again till the middle of march not that there's no fishing in that time it's just that trying to convince people to come fishing in the middle of winter it's hard it's yeah it's not easy so i needed something else to do in between that um those periods and the, the photography has been a, a great filler mm. there you have it how did you get from fishing guide to so involved and ingrained in the almost the, the political side of it and the conservation side of it as as we said the first time that we actually had any uh, kind of conversation was when we got commissioned to make a film about the Loch Marie system but i guess you, you must have been involved already before that point before we started to have a discussion well i guess you know i my uh, early working career was in a pretty um, intense business environment um and um, a lot of what I learned then I applied to setting up a, a, a fly fishing business in Scotland. You know, there was the romantic side of it and wanting to work outdoors and be a fly fishing guide. But, it, you know, behind the business is the same principles as as any other business. Um, uh, and part of looking at whether um, I wanted to, um, to run a fly fishing business was doing, um, you know, feasibility studies about the product that I was going to create. Are there fish to catch? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, is it going to be a saleable product, especially compared to, um, you know, the international offerings? How would Scotland's fisheries... Because you've got to remember <clears throat> from... that This was in 2013, 2012 that I was really looking at this, started looking at this stuff and doing feasibility studies for the, the guide business in Scotland. But I'd been out of Scotland and hadn't really fished that much in Scotland since since the year 2000 I, I didn't know an awful lot about Scotland as, as daft as that sounds considering you know, well, that, not, not, not up to date anyway yeah yeah um, so part of getting the business off the ground was doing the feasibility and that was looking at the product so what's the and the product is catching fish or a, a part of it is so I was looking at catches and things like that and I've always been pretty data driven so I was looking at the west coast and you could see very obvious kind of dips in catches and salmon and sea trout um, that I couldn't really explain, um, and then oh, I'd always been aware of salmon farming forever, I, and but only to the extent that um, I was holding on to this position that every angler does that salmon farming is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I knew at that point that I 
actually genuinely knew nothing about salmon farming, and I I don't like to have a position where it's based basically pure prejudice. And so I decided, well, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna claim that if if you think that salmon farming is bad, we'll go and learn about it and and try and figure out and understand it properly. Yeah. Understand it properly and and figure out if that's genuinely if it genuinely is. Um, and so it was. It was out of looking at catch returns and asking why catch returns had fallen, and the commentary around that that got me started looking at salmon farming. And at the very beginning, it was being objectively as objective as possible, letting go of that position that salmon farming is bad, and just saying, "Well, actually, this is an industry I know nothing about. Go and understand first of all how does it work? How do you farm salmon? What's the you know what's involved? General principles. I don't you know not going into the deep technical side of of farming salmon day to day but how does it function and then that led on to well okay so some people say this impacts what what are the possible impacts and looking at that and that's that started in 2012 and it's still I'm still going strong on that now I'm still nowhere near bottoming it out still still working through that I was amazed when I was doing the well I was gonna say doing the research but reading the stuff that a lot of the stuff that you've posted in um in recent weeks and uh, weeks and months, how important Scotland is as a. Uh, it's okay. You can you can, you can, you can cough if you if you need to, <laughs> or grab a drink or dra- grab some tea, corn. Um, how important or how big a role Scotland plays in the EU as a, an Atlantic salmon farm producer? It is the biggest in the EU and third in the world. Th- yeah, that's right. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it's been huge a huge industry. It's a it's a massive industry. Yeah, I mean, it's I think that's one of the things that that really. Oh, I mean, again, I, you know, I'm someone that's really driven by numbers and 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 quant. Um, and um, that was one of the. It, as soon as I started looking at salmon farming, it, the, it's the numbers that blow you away. Uh, and it was the scale because you don't really see it, even when you're on the west coast. Is you're not that aware of it unless you're looking for it. But the scale is huge. I mean, it's extraordinary. You're talking about an industry which generate, which produces last year nearly 190,000 tonnes of farmed salmon um, from approximately 250-something sort of active sites at any one time, although there's a, there's a lot more than that are licensed, but 250 kind of active salmon farms. There's maybe uh, 1,500 guys employed on the salmon farms, um, off the salmon farms in, uh, you know, processors, Back office marketing, possibly feed, the, feed plants for the same. Feed, yeah, um, possibly the same number of people again, and then um, the government um, and industry sort of claim through various statistical multipliers that they support. Um, you know, anything up to ten thousand jobs in the supply chain. Exports of around about well, I think the last year or uh, yeah, last year I think exports have possibly topped one billion in export value. So that's like gross sales. Um, uh, I think you know, if I, yeah, I think it was six hundred million a year ago. I'm not sure about this year, um, but uh, yeah, it's a huge, so, industry. So substantial, massive, yeah. yeah, yeah, very big. So, what from your investigation and interest in it? At what point did you realize that you felt that there was an issue here in terms of what, how salmon farming? Yes, salmon farming is, is big industry. There's big numbers involved in it. But there is impacts and consequences to having that industry, not just in this country, but in other countries around the world. At what point did you start to realise that maybe there's more to it? It was it, it was pretty early on, to be honest. The first thing I did was get hold of Marine Harvest's annual report and read that. And, and it's actually that's it's a really the because Marine Harvest is a Nasdaq listed business. It's got to produce kind of detailed reports on on how it operates. And there's a whole bunch of information in there. And it was reading the annual report and then reading some of their kind of corporate PR material and just beginning to understand how fish, salmon are farmed, the process, the technology that's involved. It was at that point that, um, you know, I I started to sort of just think, well, there must be massive impacts associated with this, just because of the nature of the the technology, which is essentially... um, you know, like a, it's basically a big net that's moored out in the middle of a sea loch, and you put fish inside it. You dump feed in the top. The fish eat some of the feed, um, and then the tide and the currents kind of wash in and out of the the cage, um, and 
um, then presumably everything that goes in kind of must come out in one form or another. And so it was at that point, just understanding the basics of how fish are produced, I was like, wait a minute, this is, this seems a bit kind of, it seems a bit, um, a bit of a free for all considering how tightly um, controlled things are on land in terms of farmers being able, you know, we used to, um, you know, as I said, my background is, uh, I grew up in a sheep farm, so we used to dip our sheep um, and you'd, you know, in the old fang, you'd, you'd have a dip, a, 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 you know, a, a wet dip. Um, and back then, like a big concrete wet dip, you'd run the sheep in, bung them ahead. You'd stand in a pit next to the dip, push the head, the sheep's head under the water. And then at the end of the day, you know, you'd bucket out the water from the dip. And all day you'd been piling in um, OPs and cypermethrin and stuff like that. And you'd, du- you'd, you know, you'd bucket that out. And then, you know, eventually, um, you know, some scientist guys came along and said, look, you can't have farmers dumping you know, organophosphates and cypermethrin into water courses because it's going to hammer, and it is hammering the wild, you know, um, insects and things like that. Um, so that stuff all became really tightly regulated, you know, and, you know, farmers aren't allowed to run slurry off into burns and um, all that kind of stuff. And then when you look at salmon farms, I was like, but everything is just free to flow in and out of the pens. And it was at that point that, you know, common sense it was just sort of common sense when you consider that's happening at the individual cage level and then there's 12 cages in every farm and then there's 250 or so farms I, I, you know i'm sitting there thinking this you know this has to be having a big impact so so what are the impacts and what what are the sort of accepted impacts particularly on the west coast where most of the salmon farms are that, that we've seen in terms of environmental and what we've seen in our in our wild stocks i mean Loch marie might be a good place to start given that that's sort of where our story started with with meeting you well i mean there are i tend to think about it in terms of wild fish welfare and waste okay those are the three that's how i've divided it up in my head and within those three big areas there are lots of different issues. There are still other issues beyond those things. So that's the direct environmental impacts, right? There are feed, for example, is a massive issue. So, um, uh, what they feed the salmon, what they feed the salmon, um, and also where the feed comes from and how it's produced, etc. So, um, the the salmon are essentially fed on, um, uh, particularly in Scotland, they're fed on a, a fish meal, fish protein based type feed. So that has to come from somewhere. So the little fish have to be caught somewhere and turned into feed. Um, they were they used to be caught in the in the Atlantic. That had to stop because the um, the uh, the amount of um, heavy metals and stuff that you that you find in the the uh, in the fish in the Atlantic meant that once you start processing it down, it was probably too toxic. And to then use it was as fish feed. Oh, well, and then it would be carried in the salmon once they ate it. Yeah, I'm not too sure about that, but um, it was certainly an issue. Yeah, um, so that now that the feed is sourced from, um, uh, I think around South America and also West African fisheries and things like that, which obviously get all the sustainable labels attached to them. But you know, it's thousands of miles away. I, I've worked in in West Africa. <laughs> I, I, I know what. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you know how those countries work, and the idea people that aren't a, kept in the best environment. So, how do you expect a, a fish to be? <laughs> the, the idea that there's a wild fishery there, which is tightly re- re- regulated and sustainably fished. You know, that doesn't even happen in developed kind of um, transparent bureaucracies like Europe, let alone West Africa. Um, so that so there's big issues around feed, around the sustainability of the feed and things like that. I, I don't really touch on that because. Um, you, there's only one thing there's only so many things you can do and it definitely has you know there are environmental indirect environmental impacts associated with salmon farming like that away down the supply chain which hopefully someone is looking at but i leave alone i'm really interested in the you hope somebody is looking at but you know what there's quite a, probably a quite a high possibility that maybe no one is well I'm, i know that some people are, are having a look at it people are asking questions okay. but um uh yeah I, i'm certainly most interested in the direct environmental impacts in scotland one of the other areas which I'm also interested in is the sort of the economics of salmon farming in terms of the benefits to Scotland. Well, it's important. It, it's important. It's really important because the reality is you're you're always going to ha- you're even in massive kind of um, reserves and and um, protected areas um, around the world. You still have um, you know economic and and human activity. There's always going to be impact, and the only way that you can really make a 
um, a kind of uh, a, a proper judgment about whether that impact is reasonable or not is to is to kind of m- consider it alongside things like economic benefits and socio-economic benefits and things to the local communities, right? So the point I always make about the environmental stuff, when people jump up and down, I'm not like a an, a, an ideological environmentalist who says there should be no activity whatsoever. There should be activity, but that activity needs to be balanced against, well, what economic benefit does it bring to Scotland? And then obviously that economic benefit is associated with some cultural benefits and things like that. So I look at the economic side as well of it. Yeah, and you, you, there also needs to be a balance between the environmental impact and what you're getting out in return. Well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's... Because otherwise economics would just run it, would run, run it, everything. Yeah. Well, no, it can I, never just be about money. No, no, it, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. It can't be just about money. Um, and the the two things have to combine but from from me from my point of view from a campaigning perspective as well um the the um you can't just consider the environmental impact on its own you have have to think about well what's the what's the benefit because ultimately my how i feel about the environmental impact um you know is going to be on a spectrum and you've got people at one end of the spectrum who want absolutely no impacts whatsoever and want everything pristine and you've got um, you know, the the guys at the other end who want as much exploitation as possible, want it fracked, mined, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Fish farms, you know, whatever you whatever you can get there. If you combine them all at once, that's even a better situation. An oil rig with a salmon farm on yeah. it. And <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, the, the important thing is that the public has a chance to make an informed decision about these things. And I know where I am in terms of the the the, the, the relative weight that I give to um, environmental impact and economic benefit and I'm sure there are other people at different points but the only way as a as a public we can have a proper discussion about these things if you, is if you understand both the environmental impact and the economic Absolutely, impacts yeah. um, and of, when, when I talk about economic impacts I'm talking about not simply just the money You're, it, the money is, is a proxy for other things like socio-economic benefits and, and you know issues of um uh, sustainable employment in rural communities and all that kind of stuff. It's not simply, you know, if uh, if salmon farms generate X, then they're a good thing. Yeah, yeah, that would be very simplistic to look at that way. And I yeah, think very absolutely. often it is looked looked at that way. Yeah. Um, so if we look at the environmental issues that surround fish farms, I mean, the, 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 it's hard to know what 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 to cover, but there there are a lot of different aspects that you that certainly that you've you've looked into and have been you know, posting and writing about in recent months. What do people need to consider and understand just to help help your your average person on the street understand what goes into producing salmon on the west coast and then what and what the potential impact before they before activities. they buy it in the shops yeah. and they put it in their mouths. Well, again. It, you know, I, I try to. I, I for me to. There's so many issues with salmon. Farming. We got time. It's okay. <laughs> um, I, I always try to compartmentalize these things so I can think about them in sort of nice little neat bundles. And as I say, I, I, I tend to think about it in terms of wild fish welfare and waste. Yeah. And that relates specifically to the to the way salmon is produced, which is what's what I call open cage technology. So it's basically a big. It's a big floating net that's tied at the bottom, um, and fish are uh, and there's a you know there's a like a a, a platform at the top, and um, that form of farming fish means that it's a there's a complete free flow um, exchange of all sorts of different things between the the environment that's external to the farm and the environment inside the farm. Well, the fish can't get out, but basically anything other than other fish can get in and yeah, any, yeah, yeah. anything so, small that can fit yeah, through okay, the net. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, for clarity, there's no, the fish are contained within yeah. the farm, but everything else that's smaller than the the uh, the, the square mesh in the, key, in the net can flow in and out of the, the farm. So the, the big overarching issue with that type of technology is that it, it has to it's it's impossible for it not to have a big impact on the environment surrounding it um and so when people are thinking about you know their purchasing decision around farmed salmon it's really about being aware of well, what are those impacts and are those impact am i willing to accept those impacts because as i said i'm not ideological about this 
in the industrial production of food, which we all enjoy, unless I'm out there digging up worms and eating tree bark, you know, we are all making a conscious choice to eat um, reasonable quantities of industrial, industrially produced food, whether that's meat or vegetables yeah. or cereals. Um, so, you know, if I eat a steak, I'm making an, I'm, I'm making a, a choice to eat that um, and accepting the impacts of the farming of beef, for example. And which you may or may not fully understand. Which you may or may not fully understand, absolutely. So when someone's purchasing salmon, um, if you really want to farm salmon, if you really want to... It, 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 the, the decision about whether you do or you don't is about understanding those environmental impacts and asking yourself whether you're okay with those impacts. Um, and for me, um, where the the farming of salmon is at at the moment and those issues of wild fish welfare and waste for me the impacts are just they're too big um for it to be a a, a responsible a responsible choice at the moment um and but that doesn't deny the fact that every every you know whether it's lamb beef or whatever it is or even you know wild fish um you know white fish being caught um uh, like cod and things like that, they all have impact. Um, it, it's not being ideological about but that. But like you said, it's it, they all have impacts. But it's it's in your own mind. Is that worth? Is that worth it? it? You know, before you consume it, is that impact that you've you're eating a piece of cod? Have you accepted in your head that the impact is? Um, you know the stock levels are fine where they're being fished from, yeah. and the the environmental impact is the is the diesel generators and and so on that kind of impact. But when you're talking about fish farming, there's a lot more yeah. uh, going on there. I think to simplify it even further, you know, when I if I buy a bit of if I'm buying, let's talk about industrially produced meat. If I'm buying that, I'm thinking about two things. I'm thinking about well, what's the environmental impact of that? Um, What's the environmental impact of that um, bit of meat in terms of how it's produced? And secondary, uh, not in, in terms of priority, but sort of equal balance, is the welfare of the animal um, uh, that, um, that's, that's been farmed to produce that meat. Um, and there, for example, I would, um, I don't eat a lot of pork, but I'd be very uncomfortable about eating intensively reared, cage reared pork. I, I, I just, I couldn't, not for environmental reasons, but for animal welfare. Uh, for so animal welfare yeah. reasons, I I would actively avoid that um, because it's it, for me that's just too it's too much of an issue. I would rather forgo eating pork than um, than uh, than accept the animal. Well, because you're you're supporting you're basically supporting the uh, the continuation of an industry by purchasing the end result. So, so yes. maybe if we just stay with the environment and talk. Kind of, like break it down. Yeah, break it down. What are what are some of the, the a lot key of, environmental issues? A lot of people won't realise there's understand. a lot of chemicals that yeah. go into producing it. So, as again, we're back to the three areas of wild fish, welfare, and waste. Wild, <coughs> the wild fish bit should really be wild fish slash biodiversity, but it doesn't work as a as a nice snappy um, three mm. word summary. Um, the 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 wild fish aspect relates to. Um, Specifically, the issues of um, sea lice um, uh, and the use of medicines um, and less so... Well, the use of medicines to treat for sea lice and any disease issues, etc., in the cage. The, 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 the presence of sea lice in salmon farming can create po- problems for wild fish populations just because there's a, an increased level in terms of the number of sea lice in water, and that can be a problem for wild fish. Like an artificially high level than you'd find naturally. Yeah. Because it, it is a natural parasite. It's a naturally occurring parasite, and in large numbers it can cause problems for wild fish. The, the other aspect is that when the far, well, and it also causes problems for the salmon farmers because fish inside cages with large number of sea lice suffer stress, they then eat less or don't eat at all, um, which means that they don't grow, um, which means that farmers end up spending more on feed. They get a lower harvest and all that kind of stuff. So it's a problem for the salmon so, farmers. So that's, that's almost touching the welfare of the the fish there or talking about the artificial numbers, density, and then the sea lice. And we know that they, they are a parasite that 
uh, agitate the fish, make them yeah. not very so well. So th- th- there's, there's a welfare aspect associated with high levels of sea lice, which I'll, which I'll come back to. It's obviously not pleasant for the fish, but um, from an environmental perspective, um, sea lice are important because in large numbers they affect wild fish populations, particularly wild salmonids, so salmon and sea trout. Um, but also the salmon farms, because it, it can affect their yields, they'll also treat the fish in the farms to try and reduce the sea lice load. And traditionally, over the last, you know, salmon farming has been around for 40 odd years. Um, traditionally, sea lice, the abundance of sea lice on farm fish has been treated by chemical and medicinal um, methods. Now, because of the nature of the, the technology, which means that there's a free flow of um, all products that go into the farm into the wider environment um, the use of medicines and the chemicals to treat sea lice is a problem because they build up in the in the surrounding environment um, and they also will affect um, the the chemicals that are used to kill sea lice um, because sea lice is a little sort of crunchy little bug that lives in the sea and um, any other crunchy little bugs like the larva of lobsters or prawns and things like that will also be affected by those by those chemicals and those drugs um so that's one of the uh the the big areas in terms of environmental impacts the the medicines and the chemicals and also the direct um impact of elevated levels of of sea lice on on wild fish populations because they basically can kill off the young fish going back out to sea potentially i'll come back to that okay the right. the other environmental impact is um the is the waste element which is kind of combined with the medicines and things like that but just in the the operation of the farm produces waste so feed goes into the top of the pen almost a lot of the feed is eaten by fish in the pens it's, it is in terms of the the feed that actually goes into the pen um and that uh is consumed by the fish it is relatively efficient um but <clears throat> because the, the because of the scale and the 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 number of of um fish in the farm you're putting a lot of feed into a farm and the, the farm's only you know the size of three or four football pitches but over the course of a production cycle you might be putting in three thousand tons of feed now you only need 10 percent of that um to drop through the cages um and to you know to build up on the seafloor that's one production cycle you know some of these farms have been around for um a long time you know 20 20 odd years even more 30 years so that Every year, there's that build-up of feed on the seafloor, um, and um, obviously the fish um, crap. So there's a there's a bit of fish feces build-up. But yeah. you know that sounds like a funny thing to say, but when you're talking about four hundred thousand fish in a it's not natural concentrated area, yeah, in a concentrated area over you know production cycle after production cycle after production cycle, that that really starts to build up and have an effect. Um, that, so that's the waste that kind of accrues on the on the seabed, and then there's things like uh, you know the operators um, cleaning nets, for example. So they they lift the nets out the farm, and they should clean them down. They, they clean them down with some sort of anti foulant thing <coughs> that's that's basically a copper based cleaning um, product. Um, so all that copper accumulates in the in the background in the in the wider environment. Then of course you know this is a heavy industry, so um, you've got bar, you've got work boats, barges, and increasingly now um, well boats uh, and things like that operating around the farms. So you've got a lot of boat traffic. Um, I mean a lot and big vessels, 150 foot. These these um, well boats are big, heavy vessels. You know 150 foot in length sometimes. So you've got all their emissions, whether it's grey water and black water and things like that. You've got all that activity which is producing waste in the sea locks and that and that when i talk about waste that's the kind of area that i'm that i'm referring to um and just to st- start throwing out stats to give it to give you an idea it's estimated um that a single fish farm let's say for argument's sake of just over a thousand tons in biomass which is about 80 or 90 percent of the 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 farm salmon that's produced in scotland is produced in farms that size so a thousand odd tons that farm will produce on an annual basis the 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 organic waste equivalent of a town of roughly the, that's twice the size of Oban, um, or let's say between ten and twenty thousand people. Um, but that's going straight into the sea. 
that's being discharged directly into the marine environment, yeah. So one farm will produce the organic waste equivalent of a, a large town of about ten to 20,000 people. And then you've got, at any point in time, you've got maybe 200 farms operating across Scotland. So the 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 raw kind of waste output from these farms onto the seabed in terms of like unused feed, medicines, feces, um, etc. is it's big. It's very, very, very big. Uh, and in terms of the impact of that and measuring it to decide whether that's an acceptable level, because there's there's waste in most in most industries, and there are levels which are accepted, and then there's normally regulation in place to say that you've exceeded this level. How does that work in the salmon fishing industry? Because it's not as straightforward as people might think. Yeah, so the, the I mean, the salmon fin, salmon in salmon farming industry is undergoing at the moment a, a review. There's been an inquiry within government um, by two different committees over the course of this year, which is transformational. You know that that it, it's going to change. Um, certainly, the regulatory framework associated with the industry. Um, I, I would imagine it's going to have a fairly transformative effect on that. One of the things that's cascaded out of that inquiry is just that the the regulation of the salmon farming industry is is spread over a whole load of different agencies um, and there's a lot of gaps in that regulation. Um, in terms of the sea floor regulation, that, that pretty much all sits with SEPA, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and uh, essentially there are uh, there are regulations which permit farms to emit a certain amount of waste medicines chemicals heavy metals is there a sea lice quota as well well that's very interesting um back in 2003 when the last inquiry was done um and um it's widely agreed that nothing happened off the back of that inquiry but sepa was essentially tasked with having responsibility for sea lice emissions from farms from salmon farms but um sepa generally concerns it generally sort of thought of itself as being concerned with, you know, non sort of biological emissions or whatever. I, I, you know, they weren't, they didn't see them as being, didn't see themselves as being responsible for um, sea lice as an emission because it was a, a sort of a living animal. But just recently, this this announcement by SEPA in the last couple of days, it would seem that they are now going to change that position and potentially consider sea lice as an emission from salmon farms that should be controlled um, and regulated within um, within SEPA, which is which is interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that develops and how they measure it, a- and how they measure it and whatnot. But um, yeah, so the, the, in terms of how that part of the industry is theoretically regulated, is that um, SEPA have limits for farms in terms of what they're allowed to discharge, um, in terms of chemicals and medicines, um, heavy metals, um, waste and feces onto the seafloor and the, the surrounding environment. But is that discharge, how do they work out that, that, that discharge? Because is somebody actually measuring it? <laughs> That's probably one of the biggest, one of the biggest areas uh, that kind of I'm concerned with at the moment is that the, a, a lot of those regulations are theoretical and, and la- it's sort of what I would describe as lab-based regulation. So the way the system works at the moment is the, is that SEPA have essentially a, a computer model which takes input data from sampling around the salmon farms on the sea floor you pile that into the model and that's all to do with um the footprint under the farm and where the cages are moored etc cetera, etc cetera. but seafloor samples are sent to sepa they then analyze them with this computer model and say all right f- based on a whole load of different things different factors um the the farm has um either a satisfactory, a borderline, or an unsatisfactory impact on the seafloor, um, and um, then they will record, you know, the results of that testing. Um, farms that have consistent um, unsatisfactory um, results are subject to um, reductions in biomass, um, which means to try and bring down the levels of emissions because they're treating less fish. 
Yeah, in theory, yeah, in theory. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and so that's the the sort of sanctions that that, that CEPA and have that has happened. That has happened, yeah, yeah. To, yeah. to be fair to CEPA, they have reduced biomass, and they've reduced biomass in the face of industry telling them that if if they went ahead with the reduction, that they would close the farm. Mm. So industry will threaten them that if they close the farm, people will lose jobs. Uh, or sorry, if they re- if they reduce the biomass, yeah. the operator will close the farm, and then jobs will be lost. Um, but to it be sounds fair, a little bit like blackmail. Though. It, well, it does, yeah, but I get that's just how it works, isn't it? You know, mm. let's not uh, and be... and these samples they're provided by the the farm. No, CEPA doesn't send divers in and collect these samples themselves. Yeah, no, I mean I, that is it, the the entire regulatory system is based on a foundation of the industry of trust, self reporting its own sampling um, data uh, and trust. Yeah, that's a bit like giving VW and Audi the <laughs> chance to uh, test their own emissions. to test their own emissions <laughs> under li- lab conditions. <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's exactly what it's like, yeah. And that, oh, that, that I mean, is a big issue. I mean, it is effectively the same thing. Audi and VW found a way to... It's to, just not very to, good for transparency. Well, they, 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 well, I mean, it's almost the same thing because mm. they, they found a way to pass a test under test conditions only uh, on one vehicle and then they've got away with it for 15 years and then they got caught not out. Not anymore. And, um, so can you see a, can you see a time where that's going to change, Corin? Uh, like, well, because ultimately you it needs to be, in my opinion, all testing for something like that should be done by an independent body. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's no point in being conspiratorial about no. this, right? Because that that, that doesn't. But it get, just seems to make sense anywhere to, to suggest that it, it doesn't seem like it's common sense that the regulator should essentially sit in an office with a big computer and the industry should send in all the samples um, and that's the basis on which um, environmental impact is regulated and assessed. That that just doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to me. I, I couldn't, I can't see that. It, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. It's not what happens in other industries. Um, it's ripe for all sorts of problems um, and frankly, SEPA have recognised that and part of this new programme and, and enforcement uh, sort of regulatory enforcement program that we've been talking about over the last few days they're looking to address that but i mean they're really going to have to they're going to have to make some dramatic changes to go from virtually zero monitoring um by sepa in terms of collecting their own data to being able to monitor 250 active sites throughout scotland including orkney and shetland um to the degree that they're getting regular, accurate, and useful useful data, you know that's going to be a. They're really going to have to go. It, it's some. a lot to monitor, though. It is a lot. Huge of, cost. It's too. a huge cost and a lot of data. So you can understand why maybe they have struggled in the past to to look at everything. Yeah, I think looking backwards and trying to explain why we're in the position we're in um, is um, it, it is useful. Yeah, and I can see that it is difficult, but. You can't have, and believe me, it's not just me that says this. It's, um, it's the regulators from other comp- from from other countries, countries who are. You got to remember, at a governmental level, they're competing with Scotland for this kind of economic activity. Yeah, they are saying to Scotland, you know, you can't have economic activity on the cheap. If you're going to have a salmon fishing industry, a salmon farming industry, you're going to have to regulate it as well as we do. Otherwise, it's not a level playing field. Yeah, it's not yeah. fair. Yeah. The reason. Many people argue that Scotland's salmon farming industry has grown as fast as it has done. So in in 1994, it was producing about 50,000 tonnes. In 2004, it was producing 160,000 tonnes. The reason it's grown as as fast and as quickly as it has done is not because of some magical property in the Scottish waters or anything like that. It's because the industry has had... a lot of freedom from a regulatory perspective to expand very quickly. And that would include things like um, the fact that um, inspection or monitoring of the the impacts on seafloor has not been done by the regulator at all um, to any to any meaningful extent ever. It's always been done by the industry, and that's a that's a huge freedom to have from a regulatory perspective. We we were talking about this. Um this earlier with yourself so you're saying that obviously if SEPA is seeing there's something wrong then the biomass needs to be reduced but you're saying there has been farms that have consistently failed for years and nothing has really happened yeah so to, to give you a, a real world example um Loch Marie 
on the west coast, which is sort of where we all met for the first time, the 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 Loch Marie story about the wild fish story there, particularly the sea trout story, where you know Loch Marie was to the game fishing and salmon fishing world uh, and sea trout fishing world historically, it's like our St Andrews. You know, it, it, it was a mecca. Yeah, yeah. Like it, everyone knew of it around the it's world. Crazy. Very, very culturally significant in modern history, let alone in you know in in ancient history. You know, there's there's all sorts of stones have been found around that that area. There's if you go to the Gerlach Heritage Museum, you'll see a a Pictish stone there from 500 AD that's got uh you know it's got a salmon carved into the stone. You know, it wild fish have been culturally important in that area for a, for a long time. Um, the the salmon the 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 salmon have suffered um in the um in the uh, in the U district where Loch Marie is, but particularly the sea trout have suffered there. Um, and the the there's a salmon farm which was operating right very close to the mouth of the U for a long period, um, which has subsequently been moved. It was moved um, uh, around about 2002, 2003 to about another two and a bit odd miles further out um, in the sea loch. That farm um, has never passed since, I guess, since it was first stocked, probably in 2002, um, that farm has never passed an environmental monitoring survey. That's the the Isle of You salmon farm run by Marine Harvest Scotland. It has never complied with the standards. It seems crazy set out. that statement that you're saying. Yeah, and so up until 2015, nothing, no, nothing was done about it. Um, from in 2015, um. SEPA finally took some action and they reduced the, the, the allowable biomass on the site from, I think it was about 1,400 tonnes down to about 1,000 tonnes. The site failed again at the end of that production cycle and last year SEPA reduced the biomass down from 1,000 tonnes down to seven, just around about 700 tonnes. So to give them a due... The biomass. So, so they are doing something that is yeah, quite yeah. significant. Num- it's it's significant if you... Yeah, it, they've reduced the biomass on the site and in the face of opposition from Marine Harvest Scotland who said to SEPA before the last reduction if you reduce the biomass down to 700 tonnes we're going to shut the site and SEPA give them their dues they just they cracked, anyway. on, they cracked on and did it anyway so we're now in the next production cycle which will finish in 2019 um, so I asked SEPA well what happens at the end of 2019 if they fail again you know there's only so many times you can fail before <laughs> you should be shut down I would yeah. suggest well, well maybe it needs a break that area it needs a complete break from for, for, for farming for a while potentially yeah I, I I don't think that SEPA will will dictate to the operator and I don't really think that they should say you have to shut down I think what they'll say is well or what they should say is, well, the biomass has to come down again until we find a level of biomass that, that's sustainable that is that that meets the regulations, mm-hmm. and that obviously still allows a lot of room for debate about whether the regulations are tight enough or not. Mm-hmm. But at least meet the regulations, then SEPA should just keep pushing it down. But yeah, so as a real world example, that's a, a farm which has not met its um, environmental standards um, surveys for. Ever, but um, that's quite likely to be stall. like similar stories to that is likely to be repeated up and down the coast. The, I mean, again, this is one of the the areas that that I'm really concerned with is that it doesn't take a lot of effort to find other issues like that which have been going on for a very very long time. And bear in mind that that. Um, that area, particularly the, the Isle of You area, there's been a salmon farm in there since 1987. So there's been farms operating... 31 there. years. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and if the the current farm's not meeting environment and regulations and the other one was moved, you would imagine... Yeah. I mean, at that point, you know, pre-2000 and something, the data wasn't even being recorded. So... Um, you would imagine it's been non-compliant. In- so we've no real idea what was going on in the past. Yeah, yeah, except that it, it, it's almost certain. I mean, be, it's beyond credibility, really, to suggest that it would have been considerably better for the environment. It would have been a lot worse. Um, so you, you, you look at that, um, and then, yeah, over the you look at all around Scotland, the number of farms that, that don't meet the uh, the environmental monitoring survey standards... And that's according to the industry's own data. 
And then you consider that, you know, SEPA did finally um, get out of the office and go and actually start sampling around, I think it was eight farms. And when they actually went and sampled around the farms themselves, they found that the data was even worse than what they thought it would be. They found, I think this was last year in 2017 when they did the sampling, or maybe it was 2016, I can't remember. They found traces of treatments, significant traces of treatments, that had stopped in 2013. There were still um, there's still traces of um, one of the the the, uh, the strongest chemical sealize treatments um, that subsequently I don't know whether it's been banned, but it's certainly stopped being used. I know it can, it's not been banned because it's still on the approved list. Um, that treatment, the last time it was applied anywhere in Scotland was 2013, and they still found traces of it enough to cause environmental damage to crustacean things like that. Um, uh, in 2000 and when they did the sampling in, in 2016 or 17. So the effects are not, they're not short term? Yeah, what yeah. That so, shows. Well, it, it shows that they're not short term, but it also shows that they're much greater than the regulator um, had um, admitted to or knew about in the past, which would raise real serious questions about whether the um, the permitted levels, the current permitted levels of use are um, safe given that they're seeing accumulations um, and residual... Um, so you might actually need level traces. adjustment as yeah, well yeah. as better monitoring. Exactly. But you're only going to find, as a regulator, you're only going to find that out if you actually get out there into the real world and start taking real-world samples yeah. that's not relying on industry data, um, which you know obviously has a, 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 a vested interest in meeting the environmental regulatory... The, the, the meeting standards, the standards. Yeah. And I'm sure that over the long term, the more SEPA gets out there and the more it looks and the more samples it takes, the worse the picture is going to get. Hmm. Have you seen, uh, other than closed containment, which I'm sure we will touch on at some point, have you seen examples of any farms that have been doing it fairly well or as good as they can? It's very difficult to be sure because, yeah. again, whether you're looking at the the, the seafloor um, impacts, whether you're looking at sea lice, whether you're looking at welfare issues to do with mortality and disease, all of that data, all of it comes from the industry. So um, if I take everything on trust that what I'm looking at is real and it's not been doctored in any way, then it is possible to find examples of farms where there are low sea lice levels, there's low mortality levels, and they meet the environmental standards, the current standards in terms of emissions. Again, that is, um, you know, it's debatable whether those emissions are acceptable or not, but sure. at least they meet the standards. So it is possible to find good examples. But again, because of the fact that there's no independent um, independent auditing of that, of that data by, um, you know, bodies that have no conflict, so, you know, governmental regulators and things like that, um, there's no independent inspection. There's no independent auditing. Last year, um, I think um, there was a question in Parliament last week or something about the Fish Health Inspector. How many unannounced visits did they do across the I industry? I saw your post on this. Um, and I think it was the the, um, the Fish Health Inspector, which is concerned with sea lice and disease across an entire industry worth billion or worth you know a, a, a billion plus um, in turnover um, in sales and things. Um, uh, 250 plus active sites. The fish health inspector, I think, carried out two unannounced <laughs> inspections. It's um, crazy. You know, I think my local bike shop cafe has had two unannounced inspections from from, uh, the from health different, yeah, yeah, things like that. So it's um, that needs to be it, ramped up. Yeah, it's possible to find examples of farms that that appear to be have that appear to be meeting all the standards they should be, but exactly it's difficult to be a hundred percent sure that the picture you're seeing is real. Um and that all that really does show um or it serves to kind of highlight is that there are places that according to the current standards can sustain salmon farming, but there are a whole load of places that That's just right. can't and that they can't sustain it because it's the wrong place to put them because it's either too shallow or there's not enough flow or you're far too close to um, wild fish migratory routes and things like that. Just to, to circle back for people who don't know the full story about Loch Marie, where, where you started t telling us the story about the fish farm there, what has been the state of the wild fish stocks from 1987 to now? 
because that's quite a telling story. It's very difficult to work out exactly the cause and effect, but the, the story that those numbers tell is quite telling. It, it is really. Um, and the, the story, there's two stories at Loch Marie, which is something that often gets mixed up and confused, especially with people who aren't familiar with um, the difference between sea trout and salmon. So there's a sea trout story there and there's a wild salmon story there. And these, although they're both fish and they're both salmonids, they both have very different life cycles. So the salmon, the wild Atlantic salmon in Scotland is highly migratory um, in terms of its life cycle. Um, it will be in fresh water in the river for a relatively short period of time as an adult. It will, um, it will, sorry, it migrates back into the river, spends a few months there, spawns in the back end in the autumn and winter, um, leaves some fertilized eggs behind. Um, the, the adults then either die away um, or they'll head back out to sea as spent fish and they, they may come back, increasingly not. But the fertilized eggs go on to produce fry and par and ultimately smolts all in the river. And then those juvenile smolts, which are very small, you know, only, um, you know, uh, a, 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 a hundred grams or so, they'll migrate down the river to the mouth of the river and they'll remain in the mouth of the river and in an estuary for, you know, not very long, for maybe 24 hours, something like that. And then they begin their migratory journey away out into the Atlantic and away off up towards Greenland. And then they're out there for maybe a year, a couple of years, and then they come back again. So the wild salmon spends the majority of its time um, away out migrating in the Atlantic. It spends a small amount of time in the river itself and then spends a very small amount of time in uh, inshore waters, in estuaries and things. Sea trout um, are very different. They um, are seagoing versions of brown trout and there's a lot of, um, there's a real spectrum between um, uh, brown trout and sea trout. You know, a, a sea trout can come into the river system and um, sit in fresh water um, for a long period of time. It'll lose all its colour and become virtually indistinguishable for a brown trout. Um, it can then drop back into the sea and then it'll silver up and become a sea trout again. And when a sea trout is out in salt water, it doesn't migrate any great distance. It stays in the inshore waters, in the estuaries and the sea locks, and that's its that's its habitat. That's where it feeds and it grows and it develops. They, they migrate some distance, but very, very small compared to Atlantic salmon, and they stay local to um, the river systems that they use. So we have way more control over our sea trout population because it's almost a resident population. It's a much more it's much more studyable because it's contained within our inshore waters and things like that. But yeah, when you consider the impact of of salmon farming on wild salmon, and you have to really consider that salmon and sea trout as two completely separate species. Um, so the story about Loch Marie is about sea trout. It's all about sea trout. So Loch Marie used to be a very, very famous sea trout fishery, a recreational sea trout fishery um, that was famous the world over. Um, you know, and it was the, the cradle of sea trout fishing, really. Um, and um, you had lots of uh, uh, people going to stay in the local hotel from the 18th, so from late 1800s um, all the way through the 1900s. You had a, a hotel there and three or four different estates with lodges and things. Um, and you had about 20 boats on the system fishing for, recreationally fishing for sea trout, um, and a big strong run of wild sea trout, probably in the order of 10 or 20,000, maybe even more, 30, 40, 50,000 sea trout coming into that Loch Marie system. Um, and then you also have salmon, but the salmon story, the wild salmon story, is more a story about the River Yew, um, which is the, the river that, that uh, that runs in or runs out of Loch Marie. So the, the impact that salmon farming had in terms of the timeline there, the first salmon farming operation started up in the mouth of the River Yew, um, uh, what, about a mile, mile and a half from the from the freshwater, um, uh, from the mouth of the River Yew. It started up in about 1987. I think that's when the start, the, the site kicked off. And you can see if you look in catch returns, which are a proxy for wild fish populations, because as a um, as a as a nation we don't um, we don't have a like a body which goes out and actively counts wild fish populations, or we didn't um, uh, we didn't then that we'd go out and count mature fish and things like that. Um, so you, we use catch returns as a proxy for wild I mean, fish we, we populations. We still 
for people to understand, we still use it today. It's actually how we grade our river systems. It is, yeah. And it's it, to be honest, it's it's riven with a lot of issues. It because, is. The, the yeah. way we use it, because um, as a statistical measure of wild fish populations, it's it, it's subject to other factors of things like, for example, um, angling pressure. So um, if you compare one year to the next, was it the same number of days fished? That type of stuff. It's not adjusted for that. Do environmental conditions, you know, how do they change? Because they are changing dramatically, especially when you compare from, you know, the 80s to today. There's there's really big changes. But nonetheless, that's what... That's, that's what you got to play with. That's what we use. And I suppose the one the one thing is, is that, um, you know, it it is relatively consistent and it's not like we're jumping around between measures. So the salmon farm kicked off in the mouth, um, about a mile and a half from the mouth of the U. Virtually... Um, overnight, within a couple of years, the sea trout catches on Loch Marie just disappeared. They dropped dramatically from, over the course of a season, um, probably one and a half thousand, one and a half thousand fish, um, you know, maybe average, you know, peaking sometimes up around 2,000, um, probably averaging around about 900, something like that, um, to dropping away down to, you know, uh, 20, 30 fish for the year. It's nuts. Um, and to today, um, you know, the numbers virtually, to all intents and purposes, virtually zero because the fisheries dropped away so no one's actively going out and, and fishing for the fish anymore either, which is, you know, one of the issues with catch returns. Um, it, there was a very dramatic reduction in sea trout population, which correlates very strongly with salmon farming. And when you consider the issues of salmon farming in terms of the unnatural levels of sea lice that are produced by the farms, the potential impact that has on wild fish, and I'll get, I'll, I'll come on to the mechanism in a second, um, and then the sea trout's life cycle, which means that they're, they're likely to spend a, a lot of time in reasonable proximity to the farm, the, especially when you consider that farms, um, you know, it's a fact that farms uh, have been shown to have an effect in terms of sea lice um, upwards of um, up to 30 kilometers from the farm which would sort of that tallies pretty well with the sort of the range that, that sea trout will, will move will move around so the sea trout of marie were spending a large proportion of their life cycle within the the, the sort of the sea lice shadow of the, the the farm there if you like the mechanism for impact is essentially that the farm will experience um large uh plagues of sea lice if you like because you'll have perhaps you know anything as i said anything up to sort of half a million fish in a relatively small area um you know you're talking about half a million salmon um in a farm the size of three or four football pitches um and um you know a wild population of sea trout of at its peak at its very you know at its at, you know pristine status you're talking about a, a population in the order of tens of thousands um, so you have these 500,000 salmon in a farm, you have uh, uh, tens of thousands of, of sea trout at the beginning of all this, the, fu- the salmon f- get infected with um, a couple of sea lice parasites, and then, because they occur naturally in the background, and then because the salmon are contained, the sea lice just explode, um, uh, you know, the they have a ready food source there within the cages in terms of the salmon, um, you know, it's not unusual, it, you know, the you know, you can see salmon in cages with, um, uh, nowadays you see sea lice counts and let's, you know, let's take the industry data uh, as it's, as it's produced. But, you, you know, you see sea lice counts this year, for example, up around 10 per fish, um, in some of the worst cases. So you're talking about, you know, 500,000 fish with an average of 10 sea lice. And back in the day, chances are it was a lot worse. So you're talking about millions and millions and millions of sea lice in an area where the, historical population of wild fish of wild sea of sea trout they might only be carrying one or two sea lice um so you're talking about ten, tens of thousands of sea lice but now you've got millions of them in the same area the sea trout would get would be swimming around in this sort of plague of sea lice that that are emitted in terms of a gradient out from the salmon farm and the sea lice pick the the, the sea trout pick up the sea lice um and the sea lice you know they don't they don't disappear off the fish they just start to eat the fish they, they, they eat the, the the skin and the the soft um tissue on the fish reduce its health and eventually in the wild the fish will die 
because um, they're not very big at this point. Yeah, you don't well, need many sea lice on a small on a sea trout small to kill it. Well, on a on a on an adult sea trout, um, on a bigger one, you know, it's going to take more lice, but it, it's still over time you're just accumulating and accumulating. Um, the best science says that on the juvenile fish, the migrating smolts, you only need 11, 11 or 12 sea lice and that'll flatten them. Um, but so the sea lice, um, uh, and that far, you know, the, the sea lice can have a very big effect on sea trout and a much bigger effect on sea trout because they're in it all the time. And of course, the farm is farming all the time. So the story at Loch Marie was a dramatic decline in, in sea trout numbers. Um, and that persists to this, to this day. Um, but of course... That's only correlation. There's never been an absolute black and white um, definitive link between um, the sea lice produced by salmon farms and um, sea trout populations. But that's only as a result of the absence of any effort to study it. There's okay. never been a study which has said there is no link. The, 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 there is, um, you know, by all um, measures of, of common sense... Um, and um, anecdotal evidence and, you know, just people on the ground. And frankly, the scientists, you know, that, that work for the government, um, once they're retired, they'll talk a lot more freely. There is a massive impact. It's just that the study has never been done. Um, uh, so, yeah, and so that was when I when, when I first encountered you guys. And the, the salmon story is very different, as I said, because of the, the, migra the highly migratory um, uh, nature of the of salmon. But the same mechanism applies that when the salmon smolts migrate down the river to begin their migration into the North Atlantic, they will rest for a while around the salmon farms. And if during that period they pick up enough lice, um, then it can affect them. It, it can affect the population, and it does affect the population. You, you, you see that for sure. But the the effects on salmon are probably reduced compared to to sea trout. And just to give you a, a, the killer stat for me is that. Today, you can fish up and down the west coast of Scotland, and people do, all over the west coast of Scotland where there are salmon farms. I will would bet you that the number of sea trout which are over three pounds, so sea trout that have survived multiple years in salt water, you can count them um, in the aquaculture zone. You'd count them on fingers or toes of one person. There is, in terms of the mortality rate of wild sea trout, it's almost almost 100% mortality rate in wild sea trout um, after two years, which means that wild sea trout will leave the rivers, they'll go out, they'll swim around for a summer, um, and then they'll potentially come back in in the autumn as finnock, so smaller smaller sea trout of, you know, a pound, something like that, three quarters of a pound, pound a quarter. They'll fiddle around for the, the spawning season, then they'll go back out the next, the next spring um, and migrate back out. Um, and then um, they generally don't tend to make it back into the locks. They might make some might make it back in later on that year, um, but very few will go back out again and then come back again. I mean, it's almost all of them. And die. it never used to be like that. No, no, no. No, you can look back, and pick up any book in my bookshelf at home about sea trout on the west coast, and you'll well, see that when you talk, when you look at catch returns, one of the things you have to be very careful about is that back in the day, in the peak in the heyday of, of fishing on Loch Marie, a sea trout was defined as being, I think I'm correct in saying it was over th it was over three pounds. They didn't record anything under three pounds. I remember the discussion. I can't remember the, the size, but you're right. The, the, the rest was just, oh, I'll chuck it back. <laughs> it well, doesn't yeah, count. It, yeah, yeah. It, they didn't record it as a mature, a mature fish. A mature fish. Yeah. Whereas today, that gets confused. So finnock much smaller, you know, fish that have been out for a year and come back in, or much smaller sea trout. You don't know, I don't know exactly how old they are because, again, the sea lice pressure reduces the size, so they might be a couple of years old. Um, but what I'm saying is, the big mature sea trout over three pounds, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pounds, which you catch if you go over to the east coast, you catch, you know, regularly over in rivers like the Dee and the Spey, you find big sea trout over there. On the west coast, you will struggle in the aquaculture zone anywhere across the, all of the, the aquaculture zone to find a sea trout three four five six seven pounds because they just don't they can't survive for more than a couple of years in the presence of aquaculture and look the scientists um, the scottish government scientists have been absolutely clear about it they have said in no uncertain terms that sea trout cannot coexist with aquaculture in its current state they can't in terms of salmon farming and the big sea trout 
uh, are not just important from well they they have a, a sporting value but they're very important for the continuation of the species because they tend to be female fish and they tend to carry a shed load more eggs yeah yeah correct absolutely yeah. um and you know to a less extent than you get in the pacific um uh the, the pacific salmon fisheries where those fish those big migrations of fish are um, the mechanism by which nutrients are transported into a river, and those nutrients drive the um, the, the biodiversity and the ecosystem there. That is is driven by um, the migration of of salmon. To a much lesser extent, that's true in Scotland, um, but still, to an extent, it is. Um, you know, you need those migrations of salmon and sea trout to ensure biodiversity of things. You know, all the way up from. Um, you know, frogs, toads, dippers, small fish, um, otters, uh, all sea connected. eagles. That you know, not having big runs of sea trout, um, let alone salmon, it, it, it is it has a big impact on biodiversity, for sure. The one thing that we haven't talked about in that case is the knock-on of employment in the area, because that is an example in Scotland of what. Uh, co- um, recreational fishing can support was quite substantial, Loch Marie. Yeah, I mean, Marie was a really good example of that. Um, it's often forgotten about, like, the level of employment that can come off an amazing fishery like that. Yeah, there's the level of employment and also the, the economic activity that's generated, um, uh, the where the benefits are retained as well. Um, so, yeah, you know, Marie was a significant fishery, um, I th- you know, there was a, a good number of gillies a, a employed across the um, the different estates and out the hotel, probably in the order of 20-odd. Um, then you had the hotel staff, um, which is probably another whole uh, another whole lump. You had the lodge staff. You'd had gamekeepers and stuff on the estate, um, uh, let alone the, the supply chain. If you, use the, if you use the government's figures, you'll probably end up with Marie was supporting something like 500, 500 plus jobs or something along those lines. Plus... Um, you know, obviously, all the money that was spent is essentially retained in the local area. Um, you know, it's not like it was a massive profit-making enterprise that you know. And none of the estates are owned by um, some people who don't live there. But um, you know, the majority of the money would would be retained by the hotel and in salaries and everything. So it was staying. It was staying in the local community. I know that when we were there and having the discussion to make the film, there was something like fifteen or twenty boats out. Normal back in its heyday on yeah. any one day, and now they don't even have a full time ghillie. Most days, there's not even a boat out in the loch. Yeah, yeah, no, there's not, there's no, there's no, uh, it, to all intents and purposes, there's no recreational fishery at, at, at Marie anymore for sea trout, um, which is a shame. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's iconic. I was pissed off because when I was a kid and I was reading Hugh Falkus and uh, TC Kingsmill, and you're reading about Loch Marie, and just what and it, it, it was this, it was this a place in my life that I thought I've, I've got to go there at some point. But by the time I was old enough to do that, it was gone. Yeah. It was completely gone. And yet these guys were writing about it like it was the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think, it's not just Marie, you know, up and down, there's Marie's... It's the most famous It's example. the most famous, yeah. yeah. But there's big, you know, there's big locks all over, like Loch Stack, Loch Damf. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's lock after lock after lock. These are the big famous ones. There's all... You have to remember when you know it was abundant and those things were really kicking off. There were hundreds of little locks and rivers that no one even spoke about because they were you know they were just they were so small and uninteresting. But you know my dad was a stalker up um, uh, up in that part of the world, um, and you know he would he was working across ground where there were where there were rivers and locks that were filled with salmon and sea trout. Um, but you know they were, they got no mention in the historic fishing books and things like that. So. You know the the loss of Marie is is really significant. It's a really good example and a really great case study. But the loch, the loss across the 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 northwest coast there of sea trout is 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 biblical. I mean, and we won't truly know what the loss is because we don't necessarily have a full measure of what it was historically. No, no, we never know where we where we started. But I mean, it, it was it, it's it's absolutely huge. I, I mean, it's massive. Um, in terms of the the wild fish, the effect on the wild fish population, and obviously, you know, up and down the west coast, you had all these, you had all the lodges and the little locks and the hotels and things that were that were based around fishing, um, and that's that's all all of that's gone. 
we've talked like about the the environmental side, but the one thing that you've actually seen in recent weeks coming up on the news is the more welfare side of of the fish. You, you're talking about the fish at the farm. The so fish that... uh, in the farm, and an animal welfare thing. If we've said it many times, if it was anything but a fish, it would have been stopped yesterday. Yeah, uh, because of the the conditions, the disease, which I'm sure you're going to touch on in a second. But the, the one thing that we've always said is people seem to care a little less because it is a fish. They don't really regard it as uh, if it was livestock on a farm. Livestock on a farm, we'd probably all be have a slightly different view on it. Yeah, oh, no, f- absolutely. If if the what's been happening, it, it, particularly in the last f- four or five years on the in the aquaculture zone, in terms of mortalities, the the, f- the number the number and the tonnage of fish that die. If that was land based, it would be, it would be, uh, there'd be uh, there'd be outrage. It would be right at the top of the the news. Uh, you know, it's colossal. Top of the you, news agenda. Yeah, the pictures. Try just describe what what you've seen and what has I mean what has been widely publicised in, the, well, in so, the press. So let me hit you with a couple of stats to to begin with, just to frame it. So. Um, the industry last year produced 190,000 tons of of salmon. Um, it's expected that the mortality rate, in terms of numbers of fish, was probably around about 20 percent. So, if you just take that as a straight average, um, you know you're you're talking about what's that? That's a fifth of 200,000. So you, you're talking about maybe 40,000 tons yeah, of yeah. dead fish um, across 200 farms. When you start to break down the numbers, it's massive. It's absolutely huge, and the the killer number in there, the one that really pricked my ears up, um, was the mortality rate. So it over the last few years, it's really skyrocketed. So the the industry states it as about twenty percent, and then by various different measures, it sort of varies between fourteen and twenty five. But let's say twenty percent. The industry is happy with that number being public. The most, the most intensive battery chicken farms run at about between five and seven percent mortality. Um, cattle and sheep in Scotland, um, because the way we farm relative to you know big industrial farms in India and America and places like that, we are you know even the big the big farm units in Scotland are artisanal. Um, you know the mortality rates there because stuff is raised outside are a little higher, somewhere between ten and twelve. You obviously have variations in that because you have, you know, the, the animals are subject to conditions. So when you have harsh winters, you get peaks. Um, but that's the long-term kind of run rate. Um, and it's pretty stable. Just to recap, in salmon farming, it's 20%. So it's higher than cattle and sheep in Scotland. It's, at it's you know, any, by some measure, three or four times higher than the most intensive battery chicken farms. Which most people find unacceptable. Yeah, and compared to the industry's own record, Ten years ago, in in salmon farming in Scotland, when r- roughly the same amount of fish was being produced, so let's say 140, 150,000 tonnes of fish produced ten years ago in Scotland by the by the salmon farming industry, the mortality rate was way down. It was it was um, if it's twenty percent now, it was probably a third of that um, ten years ago. Uh, so it would have been a lo- as low as four or five percent, and in, indeed the the, the, the managing director of Marine Harvest, I'm pretty sure, I, I can quote him rightly, in, in front of the, in terms of the committee inquiries this year at, at Holyrood, he said that he felt that a mortality rate of about 5% across the production cycle was about, would be about right, would be acceptable. So the industry has a huge mortality problem. Um, Why are they dying? Well, it's a and that it's a problem for the industry because it has a massive economic impact. So obviously they don't want yeah you know, they don't they want fish to die. They don't want fish to die. But the interesting thing is that they can die at that rate and still be incredibly profitable. Yeah, right. Um, but not only are they dying in large numbers, but they're dying at a rate that is you know three four hundred percent higher than the industry was experiencing ten years ago, um, and it's getting worse now. One of the questions I asked myself was, well, why was that? You know, and I spent a fair bit of time at kind of looking at the data and things. Um, and the main reason that I can see is because they're increasing intensity. So they're sort of the the surface area of salmon farms isn't particularly increasing, which means there's not a lot more salmon farms. They're just trying to put more fish into the farms um, that they already have. And obviously, clearly, that has the effect of 
um, you know, driving up disease and pestilence, basically, and that's why the industry is experiencing these issues. That would be my argument. And what you see as the industry tries to expand by increasing intensity is that the relationship is not a linear relationship. So it's not like you add, you double the, the production and you double the, the disease and mortality rates. It's an exponential relationship. So the more you cram in, the um, the faster the rate of mortality. And that, that's that's borne out in the, the if you look at the mortal the rate of mortality over the last fifteen years is starting to emerge as a as an exponential trend. The as I said, the you know the the, the reason I, I believe for that is just increased intensity. It's just like cramming more sheep in a field or but more it makes more sense because dis- disease spreads faster if you've And it's more extreme and it's yeah. harder to control. Yeah. More stress on the yeah. fish. Yeah. Um, and also because the industry has been going for a long time, my belief is that you're building up because the the way the the production cycle works as a farm, it takes you know let's say now it takes eighteen months, some quite often less, um, to produce a, a a farm salmon from the smoke going in at say eighty to hundred grams to a farm salmon coming out at somewhere between four and six kilos is anything between sort of as little as you know thirteen fourteen months all the way up to eighteen months, sometimes two years depending. But that the, the fish grow in the farm, they're harvested out, and then they they fallow the farm. Now, in general, farms are fallowed for a matter of weeks, and then they kick off the production cycle again because obviously it makes economic sense to do that. But that means that you are building up. Obviously, I talked before about the waste build up on the seafloor, but again, it, it it's just beyond kind of common sense that there wouldn't be a a background level of disease and pestilence that would remain because the farms are not separated biologically separated from the the, the environment that surrounds them you're you're always going to be you can never cleanse it yeah, properly you, can you you can't because it's you know that the, you're the, you've got this inflow from seawater all the time um outside the cages and there's no separation so i believe there's a look like a continuing increase in the background levels of lice and things like that um that you see uh, and the farms are essentially sort of creating problems for themselves the other but you know just by existing and farming at that intensity over such a long period of time and not being biologically separate so imagine if you had a biologically separate farm you end your cycle you chuck in a whole of the chemicals sterilize the farm boom you start again with a blank sheet of paper there's no disease there's no pestilence or anything but that's not the system we have we have this free-flowing system where all the natural um, vectors for disease and pestilence are free to move in and out of the, the, the farms uh, in, at the larval stage. Obviously, fish can't get in and things like that. Coupled with that is the effect of the industry attempting to treat for particularly parasitic infection like sea lice, a very intense level with chemicals and medicines. You're basically running a school lab experiment for natural ex- natural selection very very fast and very intensively and exactly what has happened is that um sea lice have become resistant to um the the chemicals um and the medicinal treatments that salmon farmers have used so that's the 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 different of the four different kind of in the four different sort of medicinal treatments that are licensed only a couple are used um because the other ones are essentially useless um, well, so is that why is that why there's an increasing amount of ras? I was, I was just a way to bring that because that's been in the news in the last few weeks because wild ras have been well, caught, being taken out, the taken wild. out of the wild effectively, yeah. and then shoved in a cage to do the cleaning job. <laughs> yeah, so wild ras is one of those stories which is a you know if you start pulling at that thread, it's a mass, it's a whole story and a study in itself. Yeah, um, and so I look at a little bit of it, but I don't really look at much. There's been a you know a couple of investigations recently, but yes, you know cleaner fish as an alternative to medicines. The the only reason, and I'll you know be absolutely blunt about this. The only reason that the industry is interested in 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 RAS as opposed to medicines and chemical treatments is because the chemical treatments and medicines are not effective. And they have a life. They have a lifetime of effectiveness because the lice will get resistant, and the industry knows that. And they're expensive. They're not trying to reduce. The, if those things were effective, the industry would be would, would be using them as much as they could. They don't care about the wider environmental impact. That's a complete and utter red herring. The if those things were effective, the industry would be using them as much as they possibly could. The reason the industry is moving to RAS is because they saw them as being this panacea that you wouldn't create 
by using a you know the physical removal of lice with a cleaner fish you wouldn't have this resistance but there's a study just come out in Norway very respected um well researched study which shows that immediately the sea lice are adapting or it's causing adaptions in the sea lice um the use of cleaner fish intensively because cleaner fish um pick off the very dark and, and eat the very dark brown colored sea lice which just like the moths in the industrial age changes um, the physical appearance of the population over time. If you remove all the dark ones, you leave the light-coloured ones behind, and they produce more light-coloured ones, and so gradually the lice are adapting. So they so, can't see them. So what we've seen now is, in, in emerging in Norway, is pens full of transparent sea lice that the, the ras can't eat. I didn't know that. Yeah, so it, did remains, not know that. it remains to be seen whether that effect happens in Scotland. It, again, when you sit down and think about it, just from a common sense perspective, of course that's going yeah, to happen. Yeah, well, we do it with, in farming all the time. We yeah, selectively yeah. breed. Of course it's going to happen. Now, the the other issues with RAS are that um, the, in, the use of RAS in salmon farming in Scotland is almost entirely supported from the exploitation of wild RAS stocks. Now the industry said that it was going to support. You know, it was not it, long term. It wouldn't exploit wild ras stocks, um, but that is, and they probably won't over the long term because they're going to fish them out and they're not going to be able to. But just to give you a, a rough example in terms of how those numbers stack up, Loch Duer, one of the biggest um, users of wild ras, sort of by um, uh, rel- by a relative measure, I think in the, in a recent investigation they they it was on the one show. Wasn't yeah, it? no, it was on a. Uh, similar kind of show, but down south. But okay. it's on the it's on my Facebook feed. The the um it was a I can't remember. It was some magazine program, BBC magazine program down south. who was looking at the exploitation of wild wrasse down there being being used in Scotland. Um, Loch Duer claimed that they used sixty four thousand wrasse in the last across some period of time, the last growing cycle, something like that. Okay, sixty four thousand wrasse, virtually all of which will have come from the wild almost all of which come from alternative fisheries, they claim. The reason they come from alternative fisheries is because, as their spokesman said, the fisheries in Scotland have already been fished out and they can't get supply from there. So 64,000 were used by Loch Duart. Loch Duart produces around about 2% of the total tonnage of farmed salmon produced in Scotland. Um, hatchery reared... Um, Ras in Scotland in 2017 was 58,000. So the hatchery reared ras wouldn't even meet the needs of one farm, of one farm which only produces two percent of the entire um, the entire production of Scotland. Um, so I will, I'd be prepared to place a very large wager on the fact that the use of ras in five years' time will be very low in Scotland. It is not a long-term solution. They can't breed enough and they can't produce enough in hatcheries because they're too expensive. Shock of shock, trying to intensively rear one fish to cure the problems caused by intensively (laughs) rearing another fish just shoves a whole load of problems down the line somewhere else. What happens to the wrasse once they finish a cycle? Do they... What does happen to them? Because it must be a bit of a pain to... Wrasse and lumpfish... Cleaner fish are treated as a form of disposable medicine. So what? they are used for one production cycle You're joking. and then they're binned and they're thrown away. That, I mean, literally, that is, it's bycatch of the, essentially, when they scoop them out. So they're just being they come out, discarded. They're, they're, they're harvested out with all the with all the salmon and then they're, they're killed and discarded. Yeah. Just out of interest, I've never even thought about this before until now. How are farm salmon killed? Like, put on your plate. Like, because it's a lot of fish. No, someone's not clubbing each one on the head. Um, well, they heart, they run them through a, 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 a like a just a, a standard kind of processing line and, and, and gutting line, but they they pull them out and then they um, they they stun them in water. They basically electrocute. Oh, them. Oh, they electrocute them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the, the 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 cleaner fish thing. I'll be willing. I'd be willing to place a very large wager that that, that cleaner fish, in terms of. The hatchery production that's recorded in Scotland will 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 not grow significantly beyond where it is today, and as an industry, whether it's in Scotland or Norway, the use of of cleaner fish will not be a long term solution to to sea lice. So they'll be back to where they started. They'll be back to where they started. It, it, all and, of, and affecting the wild, the, all the implications of removing that wild fish from the marine environment in the first place. There's all the all the que- I mean, 
the the wild the removal of wild wrasse from Scottish waters and English waters started without any environmental impact studies being done. It was an uh, it's an unlicensed, unregulated activity. Um, it's inching. The, I mean, there are it's essentially a complete free for all. It was then, it is now. There were some standards in inverted commas around um, the, the the catching of wild wrasse. But the you know the damage has been done, and the industry you know it's a, for me it's a great example of the industry's attitude um, to its responsibilities to the wider marine environment that they would go and remove hundreds of thousands of tons of wild fish from a fishery which are slow growing and a complex um, sensitive uh, life cycle and fish that they would do that without any environmental impact studies. Um, at all, and just keep going until they fish them out. I mean, that seems that, staggering, doesn't it? But that—that's the attitude of the industry. That—that that is the overarching attitude of the industry. They don't care about the wider marine environment. They really don't. The, the responsibility, uh, uh, business across most industries will do normally what they can get away with within the regulations that they're presented with. So a lot of that responsibility has to re- lie on the shoulders of the people who write the regulations for such things. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've worked, in a, worked in a private business for, for a long time um, through, my, um, through my 20s um, and early 30s, and um, you still have a culture within your business about your social, social responsibility and your, your corporate responsibility. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that in terms of environmental terms in salmon farming, I think that's pretty weak. You know, they, they obviously crank out the market material and PR, um, what I can't criticise the industry for is um, running a business um, and running it right up to the limits of regulation. That's their, It's the business's role as a private business out there to generate po- profits for its shareholders. That's what it, it should do um, and it's what it will do. And that's why you, there's no point in getting angry about the industry doing that. that. That's why the responsibility for where we are today lies in a large part not with the industry but with the the um the scottish government and the bodies that should be regulating it regulating in regulating the industry and pre- and protecting scotland's marine environment from um industrial exploitation and the depletion of scotland's natural capital you you can't have economic economic growth for cheap it just it just it, it doesn't work the economic part of it is very often the aspect that gets thrown back as an argument in terms of employment, in terms of um, taxes, in terms of money into the, the Scottish economy. But that is, that is another aspect which is maybe not quite as transparent as it maybe could be or should be. No, I mean... Because a lot of these are not Scottish companies. No, so, I mean, the, the whole economic thing is something that needs looked at so we can understand from the thing that I'm most interested in is what is the question I ask over and over and over again in terms of what I'm researching and, and anything I read or what, any statements from the government is what is the net benefit to Scotland in economic terms? And that, it's complex, it's a complex question to ask, but it's a relatively simple question to ask, which is, um, you know, of the, the total sales of salmon farming, um, let's say there's a, a billion pounds worth of sales, of that billion pounds of cash that's generated by the industry, what is retained in Scotland um, in terms of the net benefit to Scotland's P&L? Um, and that is not clear at the moment. And I would, But it is possible. It, oh, it's and very, economists should it, be able to work that out. Yeah, yeah, it's very possible to work it out. The government has gone some way, and, and what they will throw at you and what industry will throw at you is a document called The Value of Aquaculture to Scotland, but correctly um, titled, that document should read The Gross Value of Aquaculture to Scotland because it talks about sales and it talks about you know the money cascading down through the supply chain. But you still have to... Um, you still have to net off the costs of the industry to Scotland. Some of those are direct costs, which would be associated with proper levels of regulation. So inspect the costs of running an appropriate, and I would suggest a, a regime that, that meets international best practice in terms of inspection, um, monitoring and enforcement across the different um, regulatory frameworks. There's also the costs, direct costs of um 
you know, maintaining infrastructure for salmon farming, such as, you know, virtually all these salmon farms are located in remote areas down single track roads. And there's a lot of heavy goods vehicles moving up and down there, so they need maintained. Um, you know, you've got um, indirect costs associated with, like, opportunity costs. So what things cannot happen, because aquaculture is happening, and Loch Marie is an example of that, where... Um, I would say there's enough evidence to suggest that there is a strong enough link between the rise of aquaculture and the demise of Loch Marie um, and the, the recreational fishery there to suggest that um, you could legitimately deduct um, the the economic benefit of recreational fishing for sea trout um, throughout the, the aquaculture zone. Um, you could deduct that as an opportunity cost, let alone all the other businesses. There's many businesses which... Um, are diminished or can't exist things like um you know uh, you know the potential for ecotourism um uh is much diminished because of salmon farms diving um artisanal diving for shellfish and things like that all the things need to be deducted so you can get to a net figure because there are impacts that have been shown i think mainly mainly in other countries uh, particularly for shellfish, declines of shellfish, lobsters and shrimps. Yeah, yeah, that, that's one of the impacts. So of, you'd have to consider that like, yeah, when yeah. you're looking at the cost. You, you right? absolutely do. So that's one of the impacts of the the the, um, the buildups of um, medicines in the the seafloor is the effect that that has on populations of other crustacea. Um, but the, so the economic thing, going back to that, you, you, you know, you have to if you look at the gross the gross amount of money that the industry generates. Um, and if you're thinking about from Scotland's a Scottish P and L, you have to think, well, okay, there's the gross amount of money that the industry generates. Well, what costs do we have to deduct from that in terms of regulating it and and um, uh, and indirect costs of opportunity costs? There's also the costs of subsidies and grants um, and re- support for research. Now, that's those are some big numbers. That's a, a project I'm currently working on is trying to establish um, just how much. Um, public money has gone into supporting aquaculture and I would say that over the last five years, no not even five years, three years from, I'm looking at 2015 to 2018, if you include the academic institutions you're probably looking at somewhere I would say a minimum of 15 and maybe as high as 50, 60 million of public money has gone into supporting the industry. The um, So that that's another cost which you have to consider. Then you have to think about well um, of the uh, the money that's spent in the supply chain, you know, a huge amount is spent on feed and well boats. Now, feed and well boats are industries that are supplied from outside Scotland. So you're looking at vast chunks of the revenue that's generated um, heading off to offshore businesses in Holland and Norway for feed and well boats. And then if the business does turn a profit, those profits are returned to um, the group and virtually all, all of the salmon farms in Scotland are owned by interests outside of Scotland. Um, I think there's possibly only one salmon farming company that is actually owned by a company which is registered and pays, uh, or, or is registered and, and the, the owners um, reside in Scotland. The vast majority are owned in Norway. Um, and so the majority of profits are heading back, are heading, well, all of the profits are heading back to these um, group headquarters in Norway. Um, so when you actually break it down, and this is a, a project which is ongoing, and hopefully there should be some more stuff released on this in the next few months. If you look at the economics and start to account for all those factors, it's my belief that the 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 benefit to Scotland in terms of the economic benefit is it's large in terms of millions of pounds, but it's not enormous. And the big question is, well, and I'm not saying that. I'm advocating for aquaculture to disappear, but theoretically, as a thought experiment, if it did disappear, would it be an absolute catastrophe for the, particularly for the rural communities? And the answer is no. Um, it would result in, you know, job losses in the order of thousands in rural communities, so one and a half to two thousand job losses. But then, what would emerge immediately in its place? would potentially go on to replace that almost straight away. So it's when when I consider the, the industry, is it a good thing or a bad thing, I'm thinking about that economic side of things and all of that stuff versus, you know, the 
the real environmental impacts as well in terms of the well, the wild fish welfare and waste. But we don't have to have one or the other, though, do we? Because we do actually have a solution to virtually all of the issues that we've been talking about now with fish farms, which is closed containment. Well, closed containment is a funny one because lots of people say, well, you know, we should be advocating for closed containment and that's what we should be demanding. I don't, I don't agree with that. You um, don't? I don't agree. Closed containment might be a solution, but I don't think it's the place of anyone out, frankly anyone outside the industry to tell industry what the solution is um, and I don't think it's particularly helpful from a campaigning point of view as well the reality is like them or loathe them that it's the, the salmon farmers are experts at rearing salmon as a as a cheap food to be sold um, and consumed by the public right that they're good at that they know how to get well I say they're good at it they are the experts at it in terms of, you know, density. It's their business. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they make a lot of money out of it, so they are good at it. They know how to get, you know, they know how to grow salmon, right? It's not really my place or anyone else who doesn't have that expertise to tell them what the solution to their problems is. And if I use a, a, a an example, the rise of electric cars has not come about because consumers said to Toyota, right, you need to start making an electric car because I want an electric car. That's not how it happened. It happened because consumers and government said, right, the emissions, we've had enough of these. We can't keep having towns and cities particularly filled with smoke. So we need to go to emission-free vehicles. So you guys, Work it out. car industry, figure out how to solve that problem. All we're going to tell you is we've had enough of the emissions, get rid of them, not really bothered about the solution you come up with. And so that's where I think... it it complicates and it confuses things where people outside the industry are advocating for a, solu uh, for a solution. I think it's far simpler and it actually focuses the issue back on where the real problem is, which is at the regulatory, it's the regulatory part of the problem, which is at, at the government level, which is the government is not saying to industry, these emissions and these environmental impacts are unacceptable um, and not to the extent that we need them to. I suppose, okay, to look at it maybe another way, if that was in place and we were happy with uh, where the regulations had been set and that in order for them to fulfill that, they had to move to whatever that might be, and it might very well be because it's used in other countries, closed containment. My point is that by being much more strict on the industry, it doesn't mean that it'll necessarily disappear. The industry might still be there in a slightly different form, and it might very well be that. I'm only yeah. mentioning it because, as we know, it's used in, in Norway and some other countries as a... Uh, I mean, why do they use it? Is, is it because of regulations there, or is it because it's more I mean, economical? Must, what, what con you must know what countries are, are have regulated and are doing it better than we are. Right. Well, first of, first of all, the industry... When we talk about closed containment, what I'm... I think what is a better phrase is talking about biological separation. So s separating the farm biologically from its surrounding environment, okay? And that doesn't dictate the location of the farm or, you know, particularly how the, 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 the operation has to be run. If we talk about biological separation, that's something that is, it's beyond doubt that it's going to happen. And the reason it's going to happen is because of issues of, sea lice and disease. The salmon farming companies know that the sea lice issue in the current form in terms of open cage technology is not a solvable problem. They're never going to be able to stop sea lice larva um, coming into the cages and uh, parasitizing their fish. They're always going to have, as long as it's open cage, they're always going to have that problem. The only way they can solve the sea lice problem is by separating the environment inside the farm from the environment outside the farm. That's the only way they can solve it. And that's why in the long term, that biological separation will have to happen. It, there's, there's no doubt it's going to happen. Um, but um, what the in Scotland, obviously, you have a whole load of other factors to consider. Um, and one of the reasons that the, that the industry is kind of opposed to increasing regulation is because, you know, they're very settled, they make a lot of profit. Why would you want to change? So, of course, they're going to resist it. Um, but, you know, the the big fear with um, pushing for uh, biologically separate kind of farming methods in Scotland is that, well, if you start growing stuff in tanks, well, why would you why would you grow it in a tank 
at the end of a single track road in a remote community in Scotland, grow it there, then ship it all the way over to America. Why not just grow it in a giant tank in America? It's not going to make any difference to the, the quality of the fish or the type of fish. And that's the big fear of, that's the fear that's stoked by industry and that is swallowed by regulators in terms of closed containment being a solution for Scotland. That's not really Scottish salmon, is it? Well, no, it could be any salmon. Well, exactly, and the industry will tell you, you know, that the you know S- Scottish salmon um, affords a premium and a reputation well, because in the of the name, because of because of the the value the value that's attached to it being Scottish, albeit that that is essentially built on the backs of the hard work of um, land based farmers, uh, the the white the you know the the white fish fishermen. Um, the shell fishermen and things like that, the whiskey industry, that reputation for food excellence is built off the back of those industries and aquaculture rides Not on it. Not salmon. No, the, the farm salmon in Scotland, I mean, farm salmon is a commodity. That That's what it is. You know, It's pretty uh, much the same anywhere in the world. Um, and it's a commoditized product and they're always looking to produce it as cheaply as possible from the vast majority of pr- production in Scotland. The smaller units like Dewart, like Wester Ross, they do push for a, like a... I guess a higher quality of fish that they would say is a higher quality of fish, but um, you know I, I don't think the consumers would tell would be able to tell a massive amount of difference between it. But in terms of closed containment, the big resistance in Scotland to that is the fact that well, if it's been raised in tanks, what it's just it doesn't really seem an efficient way of doing it at the end of a single track road. Um, you know, I hadn't actually thought of that. Hundreds of miles, yeah, no, hundreds a... of miles from the nearest town. It's not very efficient. So the things that the industry is floating, but the are things like um, eggs, which are still, you know, the salmon farm w- would essentially be in the same location, but it would be a big floating egg in the water yep. that would um, have a pipe, in the simplest terms, of a pipe, a collection kind of funnel at the bottom that would pick up all the dead fish and waste, collect that, do whatever it does with it. Um, and then the fish, they'd have some um, system for pumping water seawater into the into the egg from outside but it would go through a set of filtration systems that would kill off lice and disease and all that kind of governs so they're talking about that i i honestly don't i can't see that happening i i think it's a bit of a i think it's a bit of a red herring um that really to kind of keep the regulators happen everything that you see in the industry in terms of the moves the industry is making um and particularly in relation to what sepa's just um announced would suggest that the strategy is for a much reduced number of farms, so we're running about 200 or so active sites at any one time, um, probably reducing that number over time and moving them away um, out into deeper water, um, making them much larger. So at the moment, a big a big salmon farm, you know, a couple of years ago, a big salmon farm was, you know, 1,000 tonnes, 1,600 tonnes. Now you've got farms that are going in that are two and a half well now you have farms that exist that are two and a half thousand tons you have farms um you know that are being researched that would be you know four five six thousand tons um and onwards that's where they're that's that's where the industry is going is the same tech further away and much bigger now whether that will solve the problems i don't know but um that's where the that's where the scottish industry is going with if, oh, oh, no no, no uh, carry on, carry on. with um Industry farming on land, uh, we've actually seen it in the, the shooting industry recently. Uh, we have the big red tractor for farming. We have now uh, BGA and a shooting. BGA, which is looks like a chicken, but it's, uh, it's supposed to be a pheasant. <laughs> it's supposed to be a pheasant. Um, and that's quality assured that someone, I don't know who it is, has given the big tick to the, that food is good fulfills the, yeah, the, fulfills the, 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 the animal welfare and ethical, environmental ethical. environmental standards we have that for salmon farming uh maybe you can go into it a little bit so uh, how, how it's worked with salmon farming you're talking about rspca assured are, are they the oh, or- that one yeah. <laughs> are they the only ones that have got a, a stamp for salmon farming um, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, I, 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 I we'll just come back to that. But yeah, RSPCA Assured is what you're talking about, which used to be Freedom Foods Limited, which is probably, um, it's the biggest kind of, uh, w- let's call it wealth. It's a w- welfare standard, um, a consumer welfare standard. Um, the, the RSPCA, it's the Royal Society for Prevention of against, Cruelty. Against, against Cruelty. Against it, we've got a lot of American listeners, yeah. so it's... Uh, oh, right, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty Against Animals, um, RSPCA Assured, is like a commercial arm of that, which is associated with monetizing the RSPCA brand. Okay, got you. Um, so they are a, it's a, a separate a separate entity, but very much linked. Um, and they are a, a, a consumer facing welfare brand that's it's also used for chicken and pigs and things like that but um the salmon farming industry has adopted it as well so you, you do see it on some some um packaging just on that though there i did come across you mentioned the bga and i think i'm right in saying that they they evaluate different shoots for That's kind right, of welfare yeah. standards, right? Yeah. But they don't do it. They outsource that to some, some um, another body yeah. to another organisation, right? So someone contacted me recent, recently to say that that the, whoever the the body that does the the uh, the, assessing. the, the, the yeah. assessing of the shoot has also gone and assessed has assessed all of the salmon farms in Scotland for who for welfare standards. I'm not sure for what that would be very or, interesting or why. Out. But they have, and they've passed them all. So, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, that that so, is that is super interesting. So that might be, it might oh, be. We might have guys, to look into that yeah. a bit more because that that welfare standard stuff again. It's difficult to know how much. It's difficult to know whether that's something that just excites people in the industry and gets us all wound up, and how much consumers pay attention to it. You talk about the end consumer. If you talk about consumers in terms of the, like the supermarkets buying and stuff like that, it's a massive deal for them. Like they're they're red hot on that stuff. But because they, well, they can sell it for more, it's in front of the shelves. This is it makes them look good too. Makes them look good. Yeah, well, supermarkets are so concerned with social responsibility, environment, all that kind of stuff. They have a lot of, um, you know, they do have some pretty. Um, they set themselves some pretty high standards in terms of corporate social responsibility. So they're very keen to see that the products are somehow being. Um, monitored monitored and assessed so RSPCA assured is one of the most um is what is is the is the most used uh welfare standard for farm salmon in Scotland it is one of the most interesting and controversial um issues around the consumer marketing of of farm salmon um and whenever i've talked about it online or um done any research it's been shared and read and interacted with more so than just about anything else. Um, and um, the reason that people get so vexed about it is because it transpired a couple of years ago when Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland did um, a bit of research and produced a report on funding, uh, on how RSPCA Assured receives its funding, um, that it emerged that RSPCA Assured was receiving something in the region up to potentially a million pounds a year from the salmon farming industry in Scotland um, as a payment um, for the salmon farming industry to put the RSPC assured sticker <laughs> onto their packs of salmon, which I suppose when you sit back and think about all that stuff in the cold light of day, you think, well, yeah, that makes absolute sense. But when you, I remember being absolutely shocked at that and thinking, well, it's, that can't be right. Surely a welfare standard is like some independent thing that is independent of to the industry it. and they go away and look at the industry and they decide um, whether it's good or it's bad and then they slap a sticker on it. They can't possibly be paid by the industry, but they are. The way that the way that it's the way that the scheme works is that um, farms apply to the scheme, they pay a uh, fee. They pay a fee to join the scheme, they have to sign up to a set of standards, which I'll come back to. Um, and then for every kilo of fish that's sold with the well with the RSPCA assured sticker on it, the RSPCA assured receive. receives some money. And when you do the numbers, when you run the numbers, it, it works out to hundreds of thousands, maybe up to a million, which is the single biggest revenue earner for RSPCA so assured. important. By a long way, right? So that may still be okay if the standards were kept high. The, if the standards were high and they were, and they were really good and it was independent, it was audited and all that kind of stuff, could be really good. So... I went away and looked at that, um, and um, it transpires that the RSPC Assured Standards document, which is a thrilling read at 96 pages, um, <laughs> that must have been a good evening for you. <laughs> yeah, God, it was a long, it was a long, it was a long pain, uh, a long plane journey. And if anyone is suffering from insomnia, I <laughs> thoroughly recommend it. But it's a 96-page document, which is essentially um, uh, lifts a very large part from the the document which is the 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 salmon farming in industry in Scotland is regulated by something which is called the code of good practice which is essentially a voluntary standards document very long standards document but that's the 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 document that Scottish salmon farming is essentially 
run two, albeit it's voluntary and has no um, statutory kind of um, uh, or, or statutory basis. The RSPCA assured essentially lifted a large chunk of that relevant to welfare, um, and uh, and essentially rebadged it as a as a welfare standard. It, it's it, it it barely differs from that. There's certainly the levels the the thresholds for welfare standards that most people would recognize as being important things like sea lice levels or mortalities they are no they're no higher than the industry is already held to by their own voluntary code of conduct um and which seems a bit rubbish really i mean why would you have a welfare standard which is no higher than the existing standard um uh, and then I went away and looked at, well, who's producing the standard? How is that standard getting produced? And RSPCA Assured have a, a technical technical salmon farming advisory board, which is made up of 21 people. When you look at that board, 18 of them are either salmon farmers or they are involved in the salmon farm supply chain directly. So it would be the guys producing the salmon, growing the salmon in seawater sites or potentially rearing them at the hatchery stage. Um, uh, and or transporting live fish, the type of things where you'd think welfare might be involved and or involved in the harvesting and killing of fish. 18 out of 21 are salmon farmers. It's not very well balanced. <laughs> no. The, the, um, the chair is uh, an academic from the Scottish um, Aquaculture Innovation Centre um, who is essentially a, an aquaculture academic whose virtually all of his work is funded by either industry or grants from government to research on behalf of industry. Um, so he's an aquaculture guy. Um, and then the couple of people who um, who are left are employees of the RSPCA. One is the inspector, uh, is the ins- one of the guys who does the inspections for the RSPCA, who is who was previously a salmon farmer. And then the other guy is an RSPCA kind of manager um, whose job is um, to run the aquaculture program. So again, you know, I'm not conspiratorial about that kind of stuff, but when you stand back and think, well, is there, you know, when they sit down and have a meeting, how many dissenting voices are in there kind of saying, well, you know, I think that standard's a bit low or, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. It's all salmon farmers who are all in the industry who all believe the same thing who are producing the standard. So the standard is essentially meaningless, if you buy salmon with an RSPCA, if you buy farmed salmon with an RSPCA assured sticker on it, there is no guarantee, let alone any real, in my view, any kind of sort of significant possibility of that salmon being of a, a significantly high welfare standard than you would find on any of the salmon that is, is sold without an RSPCA assured sticker on it. It goes deep. It's, but that's kind of stuff, that's the stuff that drives me mad and, and, drives, and keeps driving me on, is finding that stuff. Because, again... It's, it seems it's, very it's, dishonest, doesn't it? It or, does, yeah. It's not very transparent, because you've had to dig into it to really understand how that comes about. And yet most members of the public, because they don't have the time to do that, they just have to take, uh, take it for good when they see something which they think they can trust, like an RSPCA stamp, that... It has all the connotations that you would expect you, from yeah, that stuff. Exactly. I mean, I know from a consumer point of view, what you expect is that you pick up a product with a welfare thing, something whatever it is, whatever something that is purported thing. to be of to produce a higher welfare standard that the supermarkets put on there to make sure that you know that it's a higher or think that it's a higher welfare standard. That's the road that you're led down. That's what you're told that that or that's what you're encouraged to believe, um, and for that not to be the case it completely undermines the credibility of that standard but it frankly it's made me cynical about every single one of them um and um it's it undermines what a lot of like them or loathe them the rspca assured rspca are a big organization they've done a lot of good work over the years they still do um a lot of good work there are elements of what they do which is um you know lots of people will disagree with but they are they are they are a good for society. Put it that way, I would say, um, and the whichever clever consultants it was that advised them about how to monetize the brand um, did not foresee the unintended kind of reputational damage. It could be huge. Um, like of, eventually, of running the scheme huge. the way they are, I would be very surprised. Given the given all the stuff that's come out about it and the flack that they're taking, I'll be amazed if there's not significant reform of that scheme in the next couple of years. 
Well, there you go. Yeah. Corin, this has been... I, this has been an incredible podcast. I, there's been so much information that's come big, through this. You've got this. a big list there. We covered the... No, well, <laughs> we, we have. I, I stopped crossing them off because we were covering so so many little gems. I just thought, let's just see where the conversation goes. Um, yeah, I genuinely have found it fascinating. So thank you very much for taking the time to come out here and talk to us at the office today. It's a pleasure. I, I'm, it's always... It's interesting for me just to talk it through because, you know, I don't... I claim to be an expert in any of this at all. I've been looking at it and researching for five, five, maybe six years. Every week, I still come across stuff that that blows my mind and um, that I just I can't quite believe. Um, and I think we're only with the parliamentary inquiries this year, um, and you know, there's a good number of people um, around Scotland now. You know, a dozen, twenty individuals who are unconnected but who all take an interest in different aspects of it, who are all digging away and, and picking away at this stuff and banging in freedom of information requests. We have not, we've only, we've only begun to kind of see the the tip of the tip of the iceberg, if you like. Um, there's a whole lot more to come. Um, and um, I think the direction of travel is, is right. The regulators are, are beginning to, you know, start to get their act together. We're seeing some more transparency, but... Um, yeah, there's there's a lot more information that's going to come out, and if people are interested, really, and they, if they're if they want to get involved or get active or take a stand, I would just encourage them to go out and read uh, and engage with the information that's out there, um, and start their own start their own particular journey in terms of understanding it and learning about it, um, uh, and they will they'll find it fascinating, and it will it will. It will it will open their eyes, um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm sure provides some uh, some interesting nighttime reading. I've got a question before we before we wrap up. Okay, because what I found interesting when we first met in Parliament was the response from the politicians there. What has the response been when you've been engaging with politicians about um, th- all of the things that we've just talked about for the last two hours? What have they been saying? Because ultimately, these are the people that will be driving change change up in parliament yeah well look one of the things i get very frustrated at times with it and um it it can really grind you down the lack of progress and often the what you find is resistance to um what is relatively objective inquiry you know as i've said i'm not ideological about either the environment or welfare or anything like that i'm just interested in understanding the reality and one of the things that gives me great faith is that when you look at the information and you present it to politicians, um, all the information, even based on the fact that we have all the information comes from within industry, there's still enough there that, that politicians will engage with it and they all take it on board. They accept it. They accept the reality of the the um, the, the the impacts of the industry. Some say that it's acceptable on the basis of the economic benefit and that is entirely their right to take up that position. I, I, I'd argue the toss with them. Some do. Um, there are a lot who 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 think that the impacts are go way beyond um, what's acceptable. Um, but politics is confused by a number of things. One is the political lines, and this is a political uh, politicised issue. Let's make no bones about it. It has been politicised, um, and it, it, politicians um, are encouraged if not required to tow the party line on on salmon farming um to a degree at the moment which which may change um plus also politicians are busy you know they've got dozens and dozens and dozens of issues they've got people haranguing them about potholes in the road um let alone having to worry about some um you know problem which is far away on the west coast of scotland um so from the politician's point of view one of them gave me the best bit of advice i've had in this um, and something which I come back to over and over and over again, which was um, after that, it was the night of that presentation in Holyrood, which was, I think, two and a bit odd years ago now. Um, the the One of the politicians that night came up to me and said, fantastic presentation, I take on board everything you're saying and everything else that has been said today. Um, but um, in the last month, I've had 150 emails about... Um, hair culls and hair coursing um, and I haven't had uh, 
maybe a single email about salmon farming in the last year. So if you want me to divert my interest to salmon farming and you want to put it on my radar, you have to get people to engage with the issue and you have to get people to talk to MSPs about it. Um, and that, for me, has been something which I've, I've, I've borne in mind that all the shouting and screaming that you want to do online or um, on Facebook or anything like that, it counts for nothing unless, um, as an individual, you write to your, Paul, write to your MSP and, and engage with them and tell them about it. And uh, from a campaigning point of view, make sure that you encourage people to do the same because that's, you have to, for in the political process, you have to, the only thing that will, that will really drive up their agenda is engagement and them getting sent letters and emails about it. It's interesting. It just shows you that that does make a difference yep, to the does. politicians. Yes. So the man on the street, man or woman or child on the street, can make a difference a little bit by little bit by actually being proactive. You know, it does. And, I, you know, I enjoy the, the activist activism kind of approach. I, I really believe in it. I think there are some, there are some very good campaigning charities, um, Salmon and Trout Conservation, for me, being um, on a, another level in terms of what they've achieved. It's why, it's why we sport it through the coffee. Yeah, well, exactly. And they're, and when we talk about charity, we're actually talking about a couple of individuals um, um, who, what they've achieved in terms of um, subjecting the aquaculture industry to scrutiny, which let's not forget is an industry which is made up of billion dollar companies which have millions if not tens of millions a year to spend on lobbying and PR and resisting scrutiny um, a couple of guys at Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland managed to um, uh, managed to uh, deliver a, a parliamentary inquiry into aquaculture that was that's down to Salmon and Trout Conservation that we've had these two commit two two inquiries um, or two uh, inquiries by the, the, the two committees um, you have really effective charities. I would encourage people to to support them, and or at least very at the very least get their um, newsletter. But the the thing that terrifies politicians is individuals going out there doing their own research and engaging in the issue. Because every person will have their own take on it in their own particular part that they're interested in, and they'll, you know, if they're if they're interested in investigation and research, they'll they'll head off down a little avenue and they'll they'll rake over detail that a charity which is covering a wide gambit of issues can't and so suddenly you've got instead of having one charity to deal with who's telling you that this is what you want what they want you've suddenly got hundreds if not thousands of individuals pulling at different threads about an industry um, and you've got you know all of these different fronts coming at you as a politician and that's what they're terrified of is having, that's their, that's how they keep their jobs yeah and that's but that's what they um, what they don't want you to do. They don't want you to go out and research and find out yourself and form your own opinions and research your own stuff. They'd rather have a nice collective, you know, they'd rather deal with one body uh, than have to deal with a public that's engaged in the issues and, and is hassling them about it. So for me, that's what I keep, um, you know, sort of trying to push uh, people to do is is go and do your own thing and go and, and go and be active in your own way. Don't sit there and, be spoon fed by by an individual or by a charity, and be content with that being your level of engagement. Go and be active and and and, and fire off letters and emails to your to your MSP. You, it will make a difference. It definitely does. If people want to follow what you are up to, uh, both from your 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 guiding business and what you've been the work you've been doing on um, salmon farms, what's the best way that they can see what you what, you, what you're doing? Uh, so the, the fly fishing business is um, the wildrisecompany.com. Um, that's uh, just a, a guiding business and it, it really slap up a bit of content and fly fishing content on the on the website. You can you can go and see that. Um, the in terms of the uh, the salmon farming stuff, um, I run a Facebook page called Corin Smith Inside. Scottish salmon farm feedlots, <laughs> um, which is catchy title. Yeah, yeah, it's snappy. Um, but on that page, um, I um, bang up almost daily, if not more than daily, um, a combination of my own investigations um, and things that I've uncovered through freedom of information and documented through filming and photography, um, as well as a whole bunch of stuff from. Um, other uh, other publications and things like that and I'm potentially going to develop that a little bit more and, and try and produce some more interactive and engaging content in the in the next few months great well Karen it's been a pleasure I hope that as we get into the fishing season next year 2019 that maybe 
on one day we'll have a chance to fish together. Yeah. <laughs> where it's not work, where we could just pleasure fish. Yeah, that would be that would that would certainly be nice. We'll we'll try and make that happen. Good. Thanks, Corin. Well, thank you very much for listening. I don't know how you listened to that. You might have listened to it in one go or two parts. I'll be impressed if it's one go. Uh, that's, or, that's, you, or maybe you had a long car journey. That's two commutes to work. That that's, it's that's 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 value value for money considering it's free. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Um, don't forget to enter the competition. Yep. To win a Hornady reloading manual, all you have to do is go to the homepage of our website, thepacebrothers.com, and put your email address into the subscribe box, and we will announce the winner in two weeks' time. Don't forget to leave us feedback. Leave us reviews. You can do that on iTunes or any of the platforms that you are on. I don't think you can leave one on Spotify, but that's fine. That's cool. Uh, also, feedback. If you would like to contact us, it's podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. We have lots of listeners emailing us. We read all of them, and we try and respond to all of them as well. Uh, sometimes it can take a few days to get back to people there. We I should, we will announce this at the start of the next podcast because I really should have done it at the start of this one, which is that we have been nominated for, I'm trying to remember the exact title of it, but it's to do with Contribution to Conservation yep. for the British, Shoot, British Shooting Awards, I think it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, the link is on our social media, so you'll be able to go and check that out. Uh, please go and give us a vote. As we said in the post that I put up, uh, Beth is giving me the phone so I can get it right. Here we are. It is the great shoot. With the Great British Shooting Awards 2019, and we have been nominated for the Outstanding Contribution to Conservation. We'll mention it at the start of the next show because we know a lot of people tend to uh, tune off after the after the show is finished. So, yeah, we'll give it a give it a mention um, next time. But as we said in the post that we put up today, there are a lot of people who really should make that nomination list. The the sort of great heroes of conservation are those people who have their feet on the ground who are really and truly making a difference we try and bring you those stories on this podcast uh they're not necessarily on the nomination list but by giving us a vote we will try and give them some airtime. you can listen to this on spotify itunes podbean podcast iheart radio uh tune in radio the the list the list goes on and on you find a platform that works for you and don't forget forget to hit subscribe on any of those platforms and it means that as soon as the show goes out then you'll be notified or it will download to your phone automatically because sometimes we can be a little bit late um or we even sometimes bring out extra shows so you don't miss out on any of them at all we look forward to bringing you another great podcast in two weeks 